2024 Board of Aldermen Budget Deliberations. Today is Thursday, April 27, 2023, and we are continuing the department presentation portion of the 2023-2024 automatic budget process. Will everyone please stand up and join me as we pledge allegiance to our flag. Madam Secretary, will you please take the roll? Madam Secretary, will you please take the roll? Alderman Archiola? Present. Alderman Beatty? Present. Alderman Broster? Present. Alderman Casey? Here. Alderman German? Here. Alderman Genitasio? Here. Alderman Harla? Alderman Marlowe? Here. Alderman Moffat? Here. Alderman Morenin? Here. Alderman Paselli? Here. Alderman Parente? Here. Alderman Vitro? Here. Alderman Vitale? Here. Alderman Willis? Here. 14 are present. There is 14 present. We do have a quorum. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Is there a motion to come out of recess? I make a motion to come out of recess. Second. Motion has, and a second to come out of recess. All in favor? Opposed? We are out of recess. The first department on our agenda this evening is the Transit District, page 89, Henry Jaddak. Good evening, Henry. I'm not sure what I deserve to, to do to uh, deserve this honor, but I'm certainly happy to have it. Um, uh, Henry Janik, the director of the Milford Transit District. Uh, for those of you who might not be familiar, we operate fixtures bus services. Henry, do you make sure that uh, microphone is on? We can't hear you. It, it just needs to get. Oh, is that better? Fixtured bus service locally in town, an ADA complimentary service to the fixtured service, uh, a long haul uh, reverse commute service to Norwalk with the Bridgeport Transit, Norwalk Transit, and uh, we operate the commuter parking at the Milford Station. Uh, we're very pleased with what the mayor has recommended uh, and the support of all the aldermen in the city makes a tremendous difference in, in the operation, and uh, I'd certainly be glad to answer any questions. Is there any questions on the floor with the Transit District? Alderman Gurman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, through you to Henry. Um, what is the traffic or usage, like in Milford, how many people use the transit system? The uh, 
So the fixture bus service is approximately 22 to 23,000 trips a month. Uh, the ADA service is coming back from code. It's coming, coming back a little slower than the, than the fixed route bus service, but it does about 1,500 trips a month. And there's 500 parking spaces at the train station, and they're about a little more than half subscribed. Whereas before COVID, they were fully, fully subscribed. So how many people use it on a monthly basis, so to speak? Or? Well, for trip, trip wise, there's 23,000 uh, trips made on the fixed route uh, fixed route buses. That's and about, trips, but that doesn't necessarily I, mean how many people. I, I, I'd have to survey again, but I, I would say there's several hundred people. Several hundred? Yes. On a monthly basis, or? On a, a, yes. Thank you. Any more questions for the transit district? Alderman Parente. Thank you, through you, Chairman. Hi, how are you tonight? Hi. Um, I think last year you were giving us an update on the electric bus, kind of a little bit of a conversion or transition. Yeah, there's, there's, Could you talk uh, about that? Sure. Uh, there's uh, the state mandate that this, the state is fully electrified in all the vehicles that they support by, by 25, 2025. Uh, there's some opposition to that because many, and I'm included, don't feel that the state's going to be ready or it's going to be going a little too fast uh, for a number of reasons. But there's a, a, an order now in with New Flyer by the state of Connecticut for, I can't, I don't know the total number of buses, but Milford's been designated for three well, 35 foot buses that would be used uh, in local service. Uh, don't expect those for probably another year and a half or so. Uh, there's also the question of the facility needing to be uh, upgraded considerably to be able to uh, charge those vehicles, uh, which temporarily they'll be housed. At least one or two at the, at be, at the beginning be housed outside, an outside charging unit. Uh, there's also controversy about uh, the uh, fire suppression that may be necessary, how they're housed after the incident that happened in, in New Haven, where now there's 11 electric buses that have been sitting for a year waiting for uh, the federal investigation to be concluded as to why they, that particular bus caught fire. So it, it's still going to be a little while. Uh, I would say within the next two years, there'll be something on the road in Melford, uh, even if it's one or two buses. Uh, eventually, I would, say, I would say within several more years, everything will be be electrified. But it's going to take quite a bit of modification at the facility, which all the facilities are being reviewed by an engineering firm, firm hired by the state uh, to see just what's going to be necessary to, to do the conversions. And it's quite expensive to do those conversions. Our facility may not be as expensive as others, but I know that in Bridgeport and Norwalk, their conversions are costing two to three million dollars to convert. Uh, ours would probably be somewhat less. We may, we may be looking at constructing another outbuilding to house those vehicles separate from the rest of the fleet and until that fleet's phased out. Okay. You're Mr. Chairman. Alderman Willis. Uh, yes, thank you. Through you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I was just wondering, how long does it take, like if you have to go from Devon to the Post Mall, um, how long would that take for a passenger to get there? And are you trying to improve that in any way so it's not as much time? It, it's not so much the, the, the time to get from any point in Milford back and forth, any, anywhere. It's, it's very, 15 to 20 minutes would, would probably be the, be the, be the case. Uh, yes, 15 to 20 minutes, depending on which, where in Devon they're picking up the bus. Uh, we're on there, but the problem in Milford is that they're, out, they're one hour headways, which means they, they'll pass by the same spot once an hour. And it's uh, been that way since the beginning of the transit district. I've tried over the years, and others have, to improve that to a 30 minute or 40 minute headway. And it would mean probably du doubling the commitment by the state of Connecticut that they have now with us, and they've chosen not to entertain that. But getting from one point to another in Milford. I mean, coming from one end to the other, you're, you're looking at a half an hour, 40 minutes, you know, but most, most of the trips would be around 20 minutes. No. 
Alderman Brozier. Thank you, three, Mr. Chair. When it comes to working with other transit authorities, uh, can you talk a little bit about the collaboration there, and do you see any possible uh, benefit fiscally to combining services? There'd be some benefit fiscally. There'd be. Uh, we, we have a very small staff, but we, we have to do the same reporting that any other transit agency in the state does, be it Bridgeport or Hartford or anywhere else, or the Connecticut Transit. Uh, the, the reviews that we have, the, the reports we have to do, and the, well, the, the information that we have to provide is the same. And it's getting more and more and more every, every year. Uh, so there would be a benefit there and some efficiencies. Uh, financially, there may not be so, so much of a benefit. Uh, we may be able to provide a little bit more, uh, more frequent services. Right now, we, we call it, it's, it's an unusual collaboration countrywide, actually, where three, three individual transit agencies, Bridgeport, Norwalk, and Milford, operate one route from Milford to Norwalk. Uh, and we've been doing that since 1992. And it's very successful. It's the most successful service that, that, that we operate. Uh, there was, it's getting to the point now, but before COVID, uh, people would be on the bus yelling at the driver not to stop for more people, and people would be outside the bus banging on the door. So it was kind of, in a way, kind of nice to see. Uh, but yes, that, that, there's, there's always collaboration, be, uh, especially between uh, Bridgeport and somewhat in the Valley. Uh, with our ADA services, there's a lot of cooperation for making sure that people can get across artificial barriers of, of territories and things of that nature. Uh, and in general, it's a, it's a small, it's a relative small community of people that we meet, gather, exchange. There's quite a bit of that. Through Mr. Chair. And what are some of the uh, topics that come up mainly when you're working with your colleagues at other transit authorities, specifically those, I think it's specifically those in the Southwest, or, or if you're thinking, going towards New York? Uh, one, one of the things that's been uh, on my table for a, a long time, and it's finally coming, arising again on the state's table, we've always discussed as a common fare, is fare policy. That every, there's as many transit agencies as there are, uh, there's that many different types of fare, fare policies. Uh, the one dictated by the state is dictated by the Connecticut transit system, and everyone else is slightly different. Uh, so that you'd be able to buy a, a purchase of fair, fair media in New Haven and ride the bus in Milford or Hartford or the train and so on. So it's very it's common amongst many other places in the country. It's very convenient. It's very common in Europe uh, where you can use, use one fair media in a wide variety of ways and places. And that's, I hope to see that before, before I leave. Uh, I hope so. But there's been many studies, but there seems to be a real true effort this time by the state to coordinate would mean you know, purchases of the equipment, to the uh, fair collection equipment would have to be the same, would have to be able to do, do all the things that we should be doing with, uh, with media, with uh, touchless fair, fares, uh, fair cards and things of that nature. Uh, so that's, that's, that's been the main, uh, the, the big issue right now. Thank you. Any more questions for the transit district? Alderman Marlowe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you, hi, Henry. Hi. Um, just a quick question. You had mentioned the electric buses as a possibility for the future and the, the cost associated with that of upgrading facilities. Where does that money come from? It's not going to come from the city of Milford. Okay. Uh, it's, it, it'll be a combination, I'm sure, of federal and state money. Uh, right, prob probably be what they percentage is 80 percent the federal money and 20 percent state money and now this, the state has other monies now through all these COVID funds that they've received they may use portions of that there there's a lot of different things they're, they're trying now with that money but it'll, it'll be federal and state money okay they, I just didn't know if we needed to uh, prepare ourselves for not while well, I'm here you're not going to no okay. thank you thank you Mr. Any more questions for the transit district? Hearing none. Thank you, Henry. Thank you very much. Thank you for the great job you're doing for the city of Milford. Thank you. Take care of yourself. You too. The next department on our agenda 
is the Harbor Management and Marina. Page 110, Jim Donegan. Good evening, Jim. I have a presentation for us. Yes, good evening. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the Board of Aldermen, for giving me the opportunity to come out tonight and talk about our budget. Um, since we last spoke, we've had another great season down at the head of the harbor. Uh, we've continued to maintain and improve the head of the harbor area. Last spring, we completed construction of the pavilion and walkways down at the harbor, and then hosted numerous city and community events under it. It's worked out great. Just this month, we've completed some new small boat storage racks down at the boat ramp. Uh, that's building on the improvements that we've made there over the last several years. And we were also able to increase our capacity a bit also to try to give people spots who have been waiting. Um, last season, we had another very successful year with many guests coming to visit Milford. We were now over 1,500 nights of dockage in the marina, which is a high for us and several hundred hourly visitors coming in for lunch or dinner or just to visit the downtown area. This season, we're on track for another really great year. Both of our mooring fields are full in Milford Harbor and in the Housatonic River. We're in the planning stages for all of the summer events that will take place down at the harbor. And our marina reservations are coming in again at a very fast pace. And we're also working with the Army Corps of Engineers on dredging of Milford Harbor. We're really looking forward to another great season and we can't wait for it to get underway. Um, our budget this year is very similar to the last year with just a few minor adjustments, but I'm happy to answer any questions about any of it. Any questions for the Harbor Commission? Alderman German. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Through you to Jim. Um, first of all, the place looks great down there. All the, you know, renovations you've done, and uh, you know, small craft areas is, looks really nice too. So that's a great improvement. Um, what's your total revenues there, or last year, and what do you expect this year? Um, let's see. Last year. for total revenue was uh, $343,394. And that was an increase over last year and the year before. And we expect at least that or better. And just a quick follow-up. So what's your average night uh, cost there for a boat to come in? Uh, we charge per foot for dockage at the marina, and during the week, the rate is $3.50, and on weekends, that goes to $4 a foot. Okay. Thank you. Alderman Vitale. Thank you, Mr. Chair, through you. Good evening, Jim. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Uh, all I can say is thank you for what you do down there, and it's 100% uh, improvement over the last few years. I know a lot of things have been done. But I, I also know, as liaison to the Harbor Commission, that there are things that need to be done. Uh, can you kind of elaborate on what we are looking forward to, maybe in the next few years, as to expenditures and how it relates to development in the city, financial piece? Um, just give us a, an overview of what's on the, on the, on the docket. Sure. Um... There's certainly, there's always things that need to be done. And most of the infrastructure that's down there was uh, redone in the 1990s at that point. And now we're kind of improving on that and picking off, a lot has been done over the years and we're kind of continuing that trend now. Um, we're working on uh, restrooms and improving the restrooms. In the coming years, we are going to have continued maintenance in the mooring field. We'll have uh, some dock repair and dock replacement work that needs to be done. Um, but that's all 
you know, we're trying to pick them off as we go and keep working towards the goal. I know we have a, a problem, not a problem, but we are looking forward to dredging. And mm -hmm. if we don't, what would be the consequences? And um, if we do, what are the benefits? Well, the Harbor Commission has been working towards getting Milford Harbor dredged for at least the last 10 years. And it's been a long road to get to here, working with the Army Corps of Engineers, working to secure funding for that. Um, the last time that the mooring field in Milford Harbor was dredged was almost 40 years ago. It happened in the 1980s. The entrance channel into Milford Harbor has been done periodically uh, when it's gotten really bad. It was done five or six years ago as the last time. Um, we have secured funding um, in working with the Army Corps of Engineers to dredge the channel and the mooring field. And um, that is planning on coming up based on what the Army Corps is telling us within the next year. And that's going to help us by not letting the harbor shoal in and continue vessel traffic. How, how, how does that affect us financially? Is that going to be, is there any burden of finances on, on the city or does it come from grants? And uh, if it is going to be any burden on the city, is there a number that we're looking toward in, that, in the next few years? Most of the, the funding for the dredging itself is covered through uh, $5 million through the Transportation and Infrastructure Bill. That money was allocated directly to the Army Corps of Engineers, um, and they're the ones facilitating the project. Um, we will have to do some work to our mooring field. It's still, we don't know the exact numbers of that yet, but uh, we're gonna go out to bid, and then we'll be able to figure out what the amount is. So being an enterprise uh, commission and, and, and the head of the, har the harbor, is, do we figure that we are going to be able to cover all those expenses within the budget that you have? Um, we'll know for certain after we get those bid results back. Um, but that would be, you know, the hope. That we would be able to cover it through the, our own, uh, the, the harbor commission's money. Um, through the Harbor Commission's money or look for additional funding. Looking for additional funding outside of the city? We've tried many uh, sources outside of the city, different grants that, you know, would be available, uh, and so far have not had success in finding anything. So we don't have a number that possibility that would be the burden of the city to take on? We don't yet. Uh, it hasn't, actually, the dredging project itself has not gone out to bid through the Army Corps yet, and the mooring work has not gone out to bid yet either, so we don't know an exact number for that. Okay, thank you. Alderman Archiola, thank you for being patient. Of course, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, um, I actually just had a couple questions. I wanted to touch on something that Alderman German had asked previously. So um, you, you charge by, uh, by the foot when, uh, for docking fees. And I was wondering um, how steady has that uh, price been? And are we looking at an increase in the near future? I understand that the dock is becoming more popular. So our slips at the marina are transient. So we rent them out to people coming to visit the downtown for the night, for the weekend, or uh, even coming in for lunch or dinner. And the Harbor Commission sets those rates and they were increased slightly this year. Um, but comparatively, we're a very affordable you know, place to come visit. We want to bring people into the downtown area and the rates are set. Would that be increasing? That be something to look at to increase a revenue stream? Because, as you mentioned, that the the revenue brought in was you said three hundred and forty thousand change. Correct. Okay, and that um, those rates have been adjusted each of the last two years. 
Okay. All right, thank you. And I just have a quick follow-up question, semi-unrelated. I think I asked you last year about the truly incredible number of bunker fish in the <laughs> Milford Harbor. Um, when, you, when you get down there in late August, there's more bunker than there is water. And um, I'm wondering if that's just something we have to live with or if that's, a, if, if that's something that go, is ebbing and flowing or what the situation is with that. Uh, you know, not this winter, but the winter before, we still had bunker in the harbor right up through Christmas. And you could see them schooling around into, but that was an abnormally high year. We had them back in the harbor as we always do this summer, but not to those same extents. So it does rise and fall over time. Alderman Beatty. For you, Mr. Chairperson, thank you. Uh, thank you to you. If Alderman Hall were here, I'm sure he'd give uh, legitimate thanks based on his informed knowledge of all that you've done. So I'll just know that I know from your reputation through him and others. But I had one question um, about the grants. Are you talking about private grants? I'm thinking that there are a lot of enterprises that are interested in dredging harbors for commercial use in lobstering, et cetera. That's a little tricky. So when you say you've tried other grants, what? Uh, these were different grants through um, government sources, oh, not, government. Okay. not private. Thank you. Alderman Beatty. I'm sorry, Alderman Parente. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Drew. Thank you for all of the work you do for us in the city. Um, can you give us a little update? I know in the ARPA plan, there was a Lisman Landing, the Resiliency Project. Could you update us on that a bit and describe what funds you received? and? Sure, absolutely. Um, we had several different ARPA projects that we were approved funding for, and we have completed some of those projects. Uh, the first one was the walkways and, you know, the immediate area around the landing. And the second one that we just completed was the small boat storage racks over at the boat ramp. And for the last several years, we haven't been able to keep up with demand. Uh, the popularity of kayaking and paddle boarding over the last several years have exploded and we haven't had enough space for everyone to store the boats. And the racks that were there were 20 plus years old and really getting in pretty bad shape. So now we were able to increase our storage space by almost 40% and get all those people that have been waiting for a spot, you know, a spot. Um, we still do have uh, a couple more projects that are still in the planning stage, and one is to add electricity and water onto the one remaining dock on the east side of the harbor that doesn't have it, and the other is uh, improvements to the kayak launching area. And we've just kind of been working through them as quickly as we can. Thank you. Alderman Gurman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just another quick question to Jim. Um, the revenues are 343, 343,000, and your budget is 376. You have other sources of 31,000. What's, where do those come from, those other, other sources? Um, the other sources, I believe, and Peter can correct me if I'm wrong, but is the uh, concession agreements. And uh, Scoopy Doos operates out of there, and they rent uh, space, and they pay, you know, their agreement. And then uh, the two uh, there are two others. One, uh, the use of the parking lot in the winter time for boat storage through Milford Boat Works. Thank you, Alderman Brozier. Thank you, three, Mr. Chair, and thank you for all the great work that you do. Um, along the lines of Alder Vitale's uh, questions on the dredging front, uh, I mean, obviously, dredging is such an important piece here. Can you talk a little bit about the, um, the environmental impact, but also, and I mean, kind of broadly, the economic impact and benefits of dredging? Sure. Um, on the 
environmental side, dredging is strictly re regulated by the uh, DEP and by the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, and that's part of the reason why the process takes so long to obtain approval uh, to dredge and have a plan. There's uh, a whole slew of testing procedures that are required, including sediment testing of the material that's going to be dredged and laboratory analysis of that. And that decides where the material uh, can be transported to. And in Milford Harbor, we have uh, two different things going on. The entrance channel to Milford Harbor, most of that is comprised primarily of sand. And it migrates off of Gulf Beach and fills up the channel. And that's something that happens quickly. It happens during storms. But that sand is beneficial. And it can certainly be. So what was done in the last round of uh, dredging the entrance channel that sand was moved out of the channel and it was brought over off of Bayview Beach. And the Army Corps of Engineers did this um, with a dredge uh, ship specifically designed to do this. It vacuums up the sand off the bottom, contains it right in, drives over, it opens the doors, and it deposits it off the beach with the uh, process that natural wave motion is going to bring it towards the beach and help to nourish the beach. Um, the material that's inside of the harbor is more of a fine, mucky, it's organic material, um, stuff that's floated down in the water column and settled out, and that doesn't have as much of a, uh, of a use. So after testing, it's, uh, you know, if the testing shows that it's suitable, it's moved out to an area off of, basically off of New Haven, and it's a dredge material relocation site. Um, that answers the environmental uh, question. On the economic side, the economic impact of the harbor is great. I mean, Living in Milford, we are so fortunate to have 17 miles of shoreline, lots of opportunity to get out on the water, and the harbor is our centerpiece. Um, the amount of traffic and the amount of boats that are coming and going from Milford Harbor. Um, the city of Milford maintains 130 moorings in Milford Harbor. They're full. We've got a waiting list. There are three commercial marinas. They're all filling up quickly. The yacht club, the condos, different private areas. There are a lot of people using Milford Harbor recreationally and coming and going. There's also um, the NOAA Fisheries uh, and State Aquaculture. Uh, they have boats coming in and out of Milford Harbor. We have a large commercial fishing contingent. Um, shell fishing, oysters, clams working out of Milford Harbor. At the landing, we have space designated that they rent where we have five boats that are at the landing out fishing every day. Um, you know, and in addition to that, to all the recreational use and the commercial use uh, and the properties that, uh, you know, border the harbor, it also brings a lot of people into our downtown area, into our community. Every weekend, we're filling the harbor, we're filling the marina up with boats. And all of those people are headed, you know, right into town, enjoying our shops and our restaurants and that. And the harbor has a huge economic impact on our community. Thank you. Okay. Any more questions for the Harbor Commission? I don't see any more questions. Thank you very much for the work you're doing at Harbor. It really looks great. I look forward to uh, the annual duck race that we drop those ducks into your harbor. It's coming and, up quick. And also, I think we're at the second annual, it'll be the third annual uh, buoy Christmas tree. We just, this year was the second annual. Yeah. Um, 
we're looking forward to the third year. And we have events, you know, starting down under the pavilion and at the landing this weekend. Uh, Sunday is the walk a mile, uh, which will kick off out of the landing, and we're looking forward to all of it. Thank you. Thank you. The next department on our agenda is the probate court, page 20, 26. Judge, Judge Ben Gettinger. It's got a nice ring to it somehow. Good evening, Ben. Uh, thank you. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. I'm Ben Gettinger presenting on behalf of the probate court. As most of you know, our funding is mostly from the state of Connecticut. By statute, we're required to get some operating expenses from uh, Milford and Orange, and I believe this request is about 900 more than it was last year, and that's just because of the increased cost of um, some of the uh, materials. One at a time, please. <laughs> Anyone have any questions for the probate judge? Alderman Vitale. Thank you, Mr. Chair, through you. Good evening, Ben. Good evening. Uh, judge Ben. Um, it, it looks like your request of 33,000 plus was reduced to 18. You look surprised. No, it's no, <laughs> no. It, it was, we had asked for um, some money for some furniture and uh, it was um, not given to us, but again, we get most of our funding from the state and anything we get from so our So you can't get the lazy boy. I'm sorry? So you can't get the lazy boy recliner this year? We cannot, no. Okay. Maybe with the new mayor, I'll, okay. I'll try. Maybe. Thank you for what you do. Thank you. Any more questions? Alderman Archeola. What kind of furniture were you open for? Uh, we were just looking for um, some desks and chairs. And we, we have sufficient desks and chairs, though. So. Anything fancy? Nothing fancy, no. Solid mahogany? No. <laughs> no, no. Very okay. basic. Okay. Thank you. Alderman Giannatazio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Through you. Good evening, Judge Gettinger. Good evening. I was just interested to know, will there be any opportunity for us to come down and maybe tour the, the, the courthouse to see the condition of the furniture? <laughs> um, yes, I'd love to have all of you and um, to come down whenever you'd like. I'd certainly give you a tour. It's a very small room. It'll be a very small tour, but you're more than welcome to come down. We appreciate that. Thank you. Any, que any more questions for the probate judge? Alderman Brozier. Through you, Mr. Chair. Good evening, Ben. Good evening. Wondering if you might be able to look into an oil can with Mayor or with the Chief of Staff Rosen that comes free with some furniture. I don't know. It might be worth talking to Alder Chintasio about that one. No. Just for the record, I've gone through this process twice, have never been asked a question in the Board of Finance or from the Board of Aldermen, and here I am answering questions about furniture, but thank you all. Is there any more questions for the propane judge? Alderman Parente. Thank you. Through you, Chairman. Uh, judge, is there anything to tell the community tonight while you're here, just an update or anything else you want to share with us? Thank you for all of your work. Sure. on behalf of our community. Thank you, I appreciate the opportunity. Um, what I was also gonna say is we're a band four court, which is now the um, most busiest band in the state. Um, we have one of the highest, what's called weighted workloads, and um, you know we're doing everything very efficiently and smoothly, and um, again, we thank the support from both uh, the city of Milford and the town of Orange for our, some of our operating expenses. Any more questions for the probate court? Seeing none, thank you, Judge Ben. Thank you all, have a great night. Thank you for the job you're doing, you. helping others. The next department on our agenda is the golf course. Good evening, Dan. Good evening. Good evening, my name is Dan Worrell. I'm a golf commissioner for the city of Milford. I'm 
I'm also the person that handled the financials for the golf course. Uh, I've been doing that for a little bit. So just a quick update. The Orchards is doing very well. We actually had people playing golf in January and February this year. And some of those days are sold out. They couldn't get tee times for it. Uh, the carts that we rent are up. The volume is increased almost every year. This is the 26th year for the golf course being in, in existence. Um, and I'm, I guess I'm happy to say that I've been with the golf course all those 26 years as a commissioner. Uh, the course has improved. This year we planted 20 new trees with the help of Jeremy Grant, uh, which should replace some of the trees that we had to take down because they were fallen during uh, weather-related incidents. Sand traps were redone recently. We dug the sand traps totally out, fixed the irrigation system, and put new sand in. So that way, if you go in it, you don't take your ball out again, you play it from in the sand trap. Uh, and I'll be happy to answer any questions about the budget. It's basically the same budget that we've had for the past couple of years. I moved some money out of a couple accounts, uh, mainly to the water account and to the repair and maintenance count, account sometimes, because we have to uh, keep up the building and the carts, et cetera. So I'll be happy to answer any questions. Do you have any questions for the golf course? Alderman Harlow. Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, do you see uh, usage fees going up? They Greens have, fees? Yeah, they have gone up very slightly over the past couple of years. Uh, that is up to the management company with the approval of the Golf Commission. So we're very conscientious of what the fees are, okay? uh, especially for the residents of Milford. Um, I think our fees are very compatible, comparable to other courses, uh, but I think, I think they're reasonable. They have gone up slightly. By slightly, I mean 80 cents, a dollar. Some years it's gone up 15 cents, uh, but we try to keep it uh, respectable. Thank you. Um, do you have any other, through you, Mr. Chair, just, is there any other projects that are planned right away? Uh, the only thing we're really looking at, actually a couple things, we're looking to maybe put a small pavilion up there for when there's golf outings, etc. We do have a back room. It's a little tight. Uh, we're also looking at securing a tent from the Board of Education who's not using the tents anymore, so I would save us some money there. We're also looking into purchasing some more golf carts. The problem is we don't have sufficient room right now, so we have to get a different type of building if we go with, the, with more golf carts. Um, right now we have eight, so you have to keep in mind if somebody reserves a cart, say, at noon, that cart can't go out at 10 o'clock and it can't go out at 2 o'clock because that's the time period that the golf carts use. Uh, the golf carts make money. And uh, we're looking to get a maximum of maybe four more to make it a dozen. Thank you. You're welcome. Alderman German. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, through you to Dan. I'm um, doing a great job over there, and thank you for your long-standing service. 26 years, you said? 26 years on the Golf Commission, 32 on the Red Commission. So wow. it's been a long time. Wow, a long I time. spent most of my life there. Yeah, right. You're a young pup way back. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what were the revenues last year for the golf course? The total. To the total revenue that the management company and the money we took in for the carts, et cetera, 
was roughly $130,000. Okay, now that includes open space money also. So, I'll give you, I'll give you an example. Um, okay, so the money that goes into open space, all right, it's the amount of money taken in with the greens fees. You take 90% of that, and then you take 10% of that. That was $43,000. The total for all the carts, the city portion of it, was $30,000. We do rent the room in the back. That was minor, uh, $131,000. And because of the amount of rounds that were played, the management company had to give an additional $7,000 on top of the contract amount. So the total was, well, $136,000. 136.72. Um, it was a good year. It was a good year for the city and for the management company. And, and one more question, Mr. Sure. Chairman. What is the management company? Is it the same management company? Yes. Uh, and who are they? Northeast Golf. It's uh, Robert McNeil. He also owns a golf course in Rhode Island. Any more questions for the golf course? Alderman Brozier. Thank you, through you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for all you do. Um, when it comes to player habits, mm -hmm. between player habits and um, revenue, what are you seeing in differences since the pandemic? I would imagine over the pandemic there were a lot of people playing who may not have otherwise, but and do you see that continuing? Well, as soon as the, uh, I'll call it basically the pandemic ended, you talk to different people, some people think it's still on, some people don't. Uh, but there was a mad rush to play golf, soon as, right after that. Now some golf courses stayed open during the pandemic. Most of them were private. Uh, but last year we had 30, oh, just over 33,000 rounds of golf which is pretty good for a nine-hole course. Pandemic year, we had 35,000. Okay. I mean, everybody came out of the woodwork. They were probably tired of sitting home. So uh, they came out and played. We have leagues there that are going on. Uh, it, it's doing very well. They, we instituted a online sign-up, okay, which people can reserve a cart and also reserve a tea time which has helped out immensely. Um, instead of people just coming up to the course and say, hey, can I, you know, can I get a tea time for one o'clock? No, sorry, it's already taken. This way here, you just go online, it shows you what's open, and uh, you can reserve a spot. Through you, Mr. Chair, do you see a change in player habits that might necessitate different capital expenditures in the future? Uh, player habits, what do you, I, I don't know what you mean by that. With, a, with, an, uptick in, um, with an uptick in people playing, and if that sticks around, do you see any well, big change in technology? Yeah, I think, uh, I think with the increase of carts, the play, the play can move quicker. Okay? Um, it takes roughly two hours to play nine holes, which is kind of average. Uh, there's only so much, so many tee times you can get on a nine-hole course. Okay, um, so I think it's just going to remain steady. Um, we do have golf leagues up there that take uh, a lot of time, also. But I, I just think I think it's going to remain steady. Going back maybe four or five years ago, we saw a downtick, but it was all throughout the United States as far as golf goes. But now. Uh, whether it's promotion by the PGA or the LIV uh, program that some of the golfers uh, decided to join, uh, it's, it's come back pretty good. And we really haven't had any problems up there uh, at all. The course is in great shape, too. That's my main thing. I want the course to look good. You know, I want it, you know, I just don't want anything to be uh, out of skew. You go up there, you look, you, 
nice trees, flowers, etc. Uh, I kind of want it like Augusta. That's the way it is. <laughs> Any more questions for the golf course? <clears throat> I guess not. Thank you, Dan, for answering all our questions. And thank your committee for the job they're doing. And the golf course looks great. And thank you to the aldermen liaisons. They've been very helpful uh, for all our meetings. And Tony Weeks, who substituted for Kathy for a couple meetings. I appreciate that, too. Thank you. You're welcome. The next department on our agenda is the animal control. Scott Ellington. Good evening, Scott. Good evening. My name is Scott Ellington. I'm the director of Milford Animal Control. We service Milford and Orange. Um, I want to be pretty brief, um, keeping pretty much the same budget with two exceptions. Um, seasonal temp, I am asking for $1,000 more. The minimum wage is going up in July, and I'm asking for $500 more in electricity. Other than that, everything I'm planning on keeping the same. All's been beady. Through you, Chairperson Vitro. Hello, Scott. Hello. Thank you again. I keep remembering how good the staff was to me when I had to get my own dog out of jail because <laughs> I didn't properly uh, fence her and she's in, uh, incorrigible. Um, and I was impressed with the operation. But one particular uh, constituent emailed me yesterday, she does every year, about the status of the HVAC and the air conditioning. and. Oh. Uh, there was hope that that was going to be included. It's a stretch, but with opera funding. And uh, uh, can you tell us the status of that, and is that a concern? Uh, last I knew, Public Works came about two, two and a half weeks ago to get another quote from another company. And other than that, I have no status on it. Um, they haven't. I don't mean the that. status of the bid, but the status of the progress of whether you're getting HVAC for the. For the animals. Are we talking the central air or we're we talking in the kennels? What, I, I don't know. What did. Um, the central air is pretty much in the office. Right now, our kennels are kind of open I'm, air. No, I'm talking for the, the residents, the, the animals, yeah. Okay, yeah, our kennels are kind of open air, so to actually put like an air conditioning unit down there during the summer with the windows open, because there's really no closable windows. Um, other than that, it would be pretty much a waste. Uh, there was a plan to put in like a closable window system, but I have not gotten any updates on that. Now, who would be the person with updates on it? When you say, you report to Chief Mello, but is it the mayor? I mean, I don't even know who to ask to advocate. Am I hearing you correctly that you don't know that there's a plan to air condition the kennels where the animals reside? Is that Correct. the status? So was it put in as a request or? No, uh, there was some improvements done down at the kennel that was through a project uh, person named Pat Devine, and then he got pulled off to other projects. So it's been in the hiatus ever since. But he still wants to do the closable windows. Because right now we just have to put up plastic coverings for winter. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. You know, may I get on the record that it's very hard to hear? I don't think it's the volume, it's muffled, and so for a long evening of three hours, it's a strain. You have to really work. Is anybody else having trouble? I don't think it's my hearing. How many, how many calls do you go on in Orange Scott this past season? Um, they haven't really kept total track. Um, Typically, on calls, I'd probably estimate about 30 per month. It's 30 per month in orange compared to how much in Milford? 100. About 100? 100, 120. Um, 
That doesn't include anybody calling with questions. This is calls that officers actually have to respond to. So. Gotcha. Any more questions for animal control? Alderman Parente. Thank you. Uh, through you, Chairman. Good evening. Um, it's great to see on social media how much um, devotion the community has to the animals um, who are housed with you. And I know I often see there are times of need for um, food or other items. Is that something that we could think about in terms of your budget? Um, Actually, the community is pretty good. There was a plea out for kitten food because, let's face it, we're entering okay. kitten season. And quite frankly, it's been overwhelming. I don't have the space to store any more kitten food. So okay. it, the community is very great about the animals. So. Yeah, no, they are very generous. And I also saw that you have um, a lot of people have been taking advantage of the volunteer opportunities to come walk yeah. the dogs. And I think you only have it on a couple of days, but it seems like the interest is greater than the availability of um, time. Is that something that would be helpful for us to be thinking about, too, to expand that? Um, well, right now, there is, like, I'm the only officer on. Um, I do want an officer present in case something happens, you okay. know, because if a dog gets away from somebody, then the officer can respond and catch the dog. Um, so, and Saturday, we've only got one officer. But other than that, Tuesday through Friday, yeah, we fill up, we have okay. a schedule, we allow them in, weather permitting, of course. Got it. So, okay. um, we are working on improving the volunteer program, though. Okay. And then, can you give us an update on the cats at the gazebo at Caswell Cove? All those cats were removed, except for there was one that was unable to be caught. Uh, last I heard, she kind of is hanging over in wastewater across the street. Um, but other than that, the gazebo's gone. Every cat was replaced with the rescue, except for the one nobody can catch. So. Uh, the gazebo's gone now? Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Alderman Archiola. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Through you. Hi. Um, uh, Chairman Vitro actually uh, had asked you about uh, how many calls you got in Orange versus Milford, but I wanted to ask how many calls you had for wild animals versus uh, more domestic, like wild as in like fish or cats, coyotes versus, um, you know, uh, stray dogs and cats. Uh, towards wildlife, we really don't do wildlife, but we do make exceptions because a lot of us are animal lovers like today. Um, in Milford, there was a rabbit hit by a car that I responded to. Um, but for the most part, people in Orange I kind of take care of it themselves. Uh, the times I've patrolled in Orange, I'll see them trying to flood skunks out from, their, from underneath the shed where they made a den. Um, so we rarely get calls for wildlife from them. But we do respond if, my rule is if I can save an animal, I will go. Um, so. If there's an owl stuck in a fishing line, I'll go. If there's a deer in a swimming pool, I'll go and see what I can do. But for the most part, Orange really doesn't call us a lot for wildlife because um, there's a lot of woods there. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome. So, Scott, when I, I, I get calls, believe it or not, for wild animals so I've been referring them to DEEP wildlife uh, division that's still true right yeah it's true I mean we do have certain things where we can give advice like uh, t turkeys on the roof or something like that um, we keep little manuals and we try to give the information that we can but if it's something that needs to be rehabbed like an injured dove we really don't have the facilities to basically rehab a bird. So it would be called DEP, which maintains a list of everybody that's licensed to rehab whatever type of animal. That's great. Uh, any more questions for animal control? Alderman Brochure. Thank you, through you, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much for doing such a great job for the city. Uh, can you talk a little bit about, I noticed the rabies, um, the rabies control, uh, budget line item here. Can you talk a little bit about what animals that mainly pertains to? 
mainly that pertains to like the trap neuter release program for the feral cats. Like that was used to uh, make sure all the cats that were taken from the gazebo were fixed and received a rabies shot before they were sent to a rescue. Um, other than that, it can also be used for, say, a person is bit by a potential rabid animal and that animal needs to be sent up for testing to uh, Harford, so that would pay for any type of, mm, basically, rabies testing on the animal and the transport up. Thank you. Any more questions for animal control? Seeing none, thank you, Scott. Thank you for thank you. coming out tonight and answering all our questions. And thank you for the job you're doing for Milford and Orange. Thank you. Appreciate it. The next department on our agenda is the information technology, page 39, Adam Adler. Good evening, Adam. How are you? We're doing well. Good. Good to see all of you again. So, Adam Heller from the IT department. Uh, quick uh, synopsis, we continue to uh, provide support as well as consultative services to all the city departments to better serve the community. Uh, we have made significant improvements and strides in technology in the last several years. Uh, we continue to centralize, standardize, and improve services. We've standardized on all of our equipment. We've uh, centralized management of many IT services that are previously, previously distributed. Through uh, the budget process, we've consolidated many departments' IT budgets within one to help facilitate that process. Uh, a couple of changes, or a couple of uh, changes to line items in the budget are reflective of that. For instance, the cell phone budget sees an increase, but that's a, a reflection of the consolidation of cell phones from the fire department management into the IT's budget for that management. Um, could, could you repeat that, please? I didn't hear it, and I have a question the, about cell phones. The cell phone budget line item that's increased in this budget is reflective of moving the budget from the fire department's cell phone to the IT department's cell phone line so that we can uh, manage the fire department's connectivity and mobility. And uh, the computer line is reflective of the consolidation of all of the budgets in previous years from other departments that last year we uh, tried to go with uh, a dollar on that, and we found that reducing it from the $78,000 approximately that was consolidated was not uh, sustainable. So we're asking to restore some of that so we can supply computers and other equipment to departments throughout the year. And with that. Any questions out there? Any questions for information technology? Alderman Gurman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, through you. Um, where do we stand with cybersecurity? Uh, uh, we've made several strides in that area. We had a, uh, we implemented multi-factor authentication, which is also a requirement to maintain our cyber insurance. So we are currently uh, have cyber insurance. We uh, had a voluntary uh, survey by the state uh, elections that we uh, did very well on. Uh, we have some improvements to make, but they're nothing significant. Uh, and we are making the changes they've recommended. Uh, we continue to be vigilant uh, in all areas. We make sure that all of our servers and everything we have is up to date on all of its patching. We uh, ensure that our, we have an antivirus system that works with our firewall to make sure that if anything's intrude, if there are any intrusions at a desktop level, that uh, we immediately block that, that computer from communicating with the rest of the network. Um, so we're, we're making a lot of headway in the cybersecurity area. Has there been any breaches or anything? Thankfully, we have not suffered any breaches. And we haven't seen or? Not, not since I've been here. No, we have not suffered a breach at this point. All right. Terrific. Thank you. Any more questions for information technology? Alderman Parente. Thank you, Chairman Thrill. Hi, good evening. Hi. Um, a definite big thank you to, for the work you do to keep our city uh, infrastructure uh, running. Is there anything that you would have on a wish, wish list as you anticipate needs changing? Because I, I imagine this is a very fluid um, kind of thing in terms of what you have to look out for, what uh, needs you have to address for the different departments as they've transitioned over to having this consolidated process. Just for us to be aware of what might be upcoming, if there was something that you could have right now that you is not reflected in the budget, uh, we'd love to get your feedback. Thank you. Great. 
Uh, well, thankfully, the administration and the board has been very supportive of the improvements we've made in technology. We've made a lot of great strides in that area. Uh, what's going to be coming down the road is more um, decentralization of IT services to be hosted by either application providers or cloud services, which introduces a host of issues with security as well as uh, management of those applications as they leave the data center and go to other data centers. So there'll be a lot more focus. The focus will move more away from desktop support, which is where most of the, the support, or most of the staff is focused on now, and move towards centralized services for cloud management, application management, network and security management, and things of those nature. So down the road, we're gonna probably start looking at roles and responsibilities of the staff and see how we can uh, adapt them more towards a future, uh, the future environment we're going to have. Any more questions for information technology? Alderman Vitale. Thank you, Mr. Chair, through you. Hi, Adam. Hi. Welcome. Thank you. Um, can you tell us what happened between the mayor's recommendation, your, your department request, the mayor's recommendation and the Board of Finance for an increase of $6,000. Where are we looking at specifically? Total budget, department total. On the end, end page 39, okay. last item. Uh, Peter could probably correct me on this, but I believe there's probably some settlement of union contracts that happened in between the request to the uh, final budget. That's, that's what I'm thinking. If that's what it is, that's adequate. I just didn't know what happened between those two meetings, that's all. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Alderman Archiola. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, through you. Hi, Adam. Hi. Um, I just had a quick question about the uh, line item for software and maintenance. Um, is that for software licensing? And, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, please. Oh, and if please. so, um, I wanted to know, is that uh, re-upping on the licensing, or is that a one-time expenditure for the software that you use? And then a second part to that question is, uh, could you expand on the maintenance costs associated with using the software? Sure, that's a great question, and probably one I should have brought up with Alderman Parente's question about future. Uh, the industry has seen a shift from one-time purchases to a subscription-based uh, model. Uh, those subscriptions, such as Office 365 and um, our tax collection system, our assessment system, all of those computer systems that we use we pay annually for maintenance and support to the vendors who supply those uh, software packages. That comes out of this line. Uh, and that, as we move more towards hosted and cloud-based applications, um, that's going to be an increase in that area. And unfortunately, there's no, really not much more of the buy and hold situation anymore. It's more of the, the leasing and, and model on an annual basis. And could you just go over the, some of the maintenance costs associated with the software? Uh, I don't have any exact figures in front of me, but I can I estimate, for instance, Munis is roughly $190,000 a year. Um, one thing we have not reflected in here, because we had other means to pay for it, would be Office 365. That's, gonna, that's close to $200,000 a year for that. Uh, vision appraisal is roughly $60,000 a year. Um, I'm, I, the rest I'd have to look up. Those are just the ones at the top of mind at the moment. But yeah, they're, they're pricey. Thank you very much. Alderman German. Thank you. One more follow-up, Adam. Sure. Um, you have a line item for professional fees of 75000 I thought you guys were the professionals. What's, what's that for? Even the professionals need help from other professionals at times. Uh, we utilize a local company, uh, Vancord, to help provide support to all the, to, for us to uh, help us when we need help. Um, we have, we're jack of all trades, master of none. So we, uh, when it comes to complex issues with network, server, maintenance, security, what have you, we rely on them to assist us with those things. And that includes all departments, along with police, fire, and all other city departments. But there's no direct support from departments with them. That all goes through us. And then when we decide we need extra assistance, we engage them. So that's a sub sub subscription? Subscription? It's an annual support cost, yes. Right. Yeah. Right. Thank you. And BD. Thank you. Through you, Chairperson Vitro. I have, always have a question about training, and it's related to uh, the last question. Um, 
it seems like a very small uh, a pittance amount, training expenses 2000 but I suppose you just answered the question by saying you have somebody on retainer who can help. But I'm thinking with all the news about AI and risks that you're always training your IT people, and I wondered if you short sheeted yourself here a little. Well, there's always a balance between training and availability for staff for the departments. We have a very small staff. Um, so we do a lot of our training at our desks. We will Google, YouTube, and do what we can to, to get information on things. Typically, when we bring new applications on board, we do training to the vendors of, for that as well and document that. Um, every, I always say this is the one job where every day you show up to work, you're obsolete because everything you learned yesterday is changed today. <laughs> so we have to focus on where we're going strategically so we can plan out exactly what we need to know before we actually implement it. So oftentimes we have to know before the departments know how something right. is going to operate. So could there be more in training and could we do more training? 100%. Um, but with what we've had so far, we've been able to maintain services pretty well. So can we anticipate that you would put in more for training and, and from what you just said? And you know, going forward, at this, at, if we could start working towards uh, transitioning away from the desktop support arena and more into the centralized services for server and network, like I outlined earlier, then yes, we'd have to transition the staff into a different role. Right. And then, uh, is there truth to this question or the, uh, the the context of the question? We talked to HR and they talked about what you said, the subscriptions to and licensing agreements for the new software, but they only use a portion of the software. So you purchase suite or lease a suite, but they're not utilizing it all for the job description. Is that under utilization okay, or should there be more training so that they're utilizing more of the function of the thing we're paying for? Well, that's uh, an area that I am not, we'd have to ask HR what what they need the software for and what they, if they're adequately uh, trained in using it correctly. A lot of times software comes in packages. You, you right. don't get to select which pieces you, you get to purchase. So many times you buy a software package that's really appropriate for your purposes, works really well, but it comes with a lot of other stuff. Right. That you may or may not need based on your operations, which is why I would refer that to HR. If, if and would that be too, true for the, the city uh, administrative service personnel that some of that software is underutilized, and is that okay? Maybe they just don't need it for the job description and operation. So over the last several years, we've made a tremendous amount of changes in the technology of the city, and it's, the staff has done an amazing job in learning right. all of the new software and all of the new things that have come in uh, while maintaining operations in their own jobs. Uh, we and HR are working to make sure that we're more fully utilizing all of that software. I know HR, through their testing software, has rolled out office application training, so Word, Excel, PowerPoint, and I know that they've had a lot of interest in using those, in uh, the staff learning those systems. We are also ourselves, through IT, transitioning from a traditional manner in which people store their files on the network to more of utilizing Office 365, which would also incorporate Teams in that as well. So there's applications that come with Office that we aren't using, that we are helping departments transition to. So. There's been a so lot of So isn't there a learning curve with the teams? I don't want to belabor this. 100%. But isn't that so? And so where would the training resources, time, money, come? In your department or in HR or in the city administrative services? I'm just wondering. So far between HR and what they have available to them through their testing software and through our own staff and their knowledge, we've been able to manage that. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Alderman Brozier. Thanks through you, Mr. Chair. Adam, hope you're doing well. Thank you for coming tonight. And I want to thank you and the mayor for your, the great work you've done in consolidating um, the uh, kind of with the cost savings and the loss prevention benefits of consolidating IT services into IT. Can you talk a little bit about um, what those cost savings are and the loss prevent, prevention benefits to doing so? Certainly. Uh, by consolidating uh, IT uh, services, specifically with computers, for instance, we're able to standardize equipment. In the past, we would have departments order their own computers. They could order any num anything that they really chose to, and the IT department wouldn't be aware of what they were buying until we, they got the call that we got this computer. 
And because every computer was custom, it would take custom building by the IT department for every one of those computers. It could take days for a computer to be deployed. By standardizing on one computer, we're able to create what's called an image, which reduces our deployment time from days to minutes, frankly. It takes about 20 minutes for us to, to uh, rebuild the computer. Further, we had an issue in the past with the distributed budgets that if a computer in one department needed to be replaced, they may not necessarily have the budget, while another department did have the budget and didn't even need a computer to be replaced. At this point, I've also been able to see a reduction in support time in that if a computer needs to be replaced, I've instructed the staff if it takes more than 20 minutes to fix it, build them a new one and give them a new one, bring back the old one, and we can repair it in the office, which reduces the downtime of anybody working on that computer at their desk. So the, the amount of downtime we've had for desktops has been reduced to almost nil. The amount of time it takes to replace or maintain those computers has also reduced significantly over, over the time that we've, we've had. Um, by updating and upgrading office products, we've been able to uh, help with efficiencies with uh, managing or uh, creating documents, storing those documents, and retrieving those documents. Uh, in the past, it's been various versions of Office because along with the purchasing of a computer, the department would also buy Office, whichever flavor or version of Office was available at that time. We've been able to centralize and standardize all of that and make it a lot simpler to be able to keep those applications up to date, especially in light of security concerns, ensuring those patches are applied and that uh, our, our systems are always up to date. So we've significantly reduced costs as far as uh, downtime and uh, availability of, of computers. We've also, through virtualizing all of our servers, have made it our ability to restore a system that may be down from, could be days, to also uh, minutes to an hour at this point. So if we were unfortunately to lose the tax collection system, before it may take quite a while for us to restore that, and during tax collection season it would be very uh, unfortunate, where now we can restore that within the hour. So it's been a, a tremendous change over the last few years. Thank you. Any more questions for IT department? I don't see any more. Great. Thank you very much. Th thank you, Adam. Thank you for coming out and answering all our questions for us. Thank you. The next department on our agenda is the health department. Ms. Deepa Joseph. Good evening, Deepa. Good evening. Um, if I can have permission to approach to give you a handout. everyone. Um, I'm here with our board chair, Joan Caginello, who's joined me tonight. Um, as you all are accustomed to over the past several years, I always like to use this opportunity with the board to be able to share some of our accomplishments from the past um, fiscal year. And so I've provided um, a little, this has become now a booklet over the years. It used to be a page or two, and now it's expanded, which is really reflective of the expansion of services we've had over the years and the increasing responsibilities that the Health and Human Services Department has had over the years. So I'd like to do a, just a quick glance, and you're welcome to review this information and ask any questions that you have. Um, so I'll start out with the School Health and Public Health Nursing Division. Um, you know, the biggest change there is um, obviously with the pandemic, our services, particularly in public health nursing and um, immunization clinics and vaccination clinics um, have continued to be robust and um, increased from previous years due to the COVID vaccine clinics in particular. So we've done 40 immunization clinics, um, and in terms of COVID-19 doses over this past fiscal year, over 2,000 doses administered, over 600 doses of flu vaccine, 
And then um, with school nursing, you'll continue to see that our school nurses um, are really still, they are not just doing band-aids and um, small minor injuries. They really have a lot of um, complex cases. They have uh, students where they're administering close to 11,000 medications and treatments that are being administered over a school year, over 10,000 screenings, um, and over 37,000 health office visits to the nurses. And that is a team of 20 nurses throughout our schools in Milford. Um, and then the Community Health Division, which this is our division that really um, oversees a lot of our health education programs, our grant management, our communicable disease surveillance. Uh, and so, uh, obviously, again, uh, over the past year, COVID cases and the surveillance and monitoring with that, um, you know, really took up a lot of time over the, over the year. Um, but we do continue to obtain grants to support the work that we do, as you'll see in the budget. Um, you know, the budget really largely supports our wages and our workforce, and we utilize our grant funding to be able to support the programs and a lot of the services we provide in the community, um, everything from asthma programs to our public health emergency preparedness program, which was critical over the past three years, um, healthy homes programs, opioid prevention programs, um, and programs such as that. Um, and then our environmental health division is our division that really deals with, um, is more of our enforcement division. And so I've included um, within the booklet some, just some numbers relative to the services that we provide over the past fiscal year, over 500 um, food service licenses issued, um, close to 1,000 inspections. Um, we also take all complaints uh, on a variety of issues, and um, those complaints are investigated, everything from blight to housing conditions. Um, and then from Memorial Day to Labor Day, we are doing beach water sampling, um, and then a variety of other services, our vector control program, which you see reflected in our budget as well, which is our mosquito control program that kicks off in April and goes through October of every year. Um, and then I have to also included the blue page in here, which just gives you an overview of with, with the pandemic. Um, one of the things I'll say is the past two years on this handout, COVID has been kind of at the forefront of this handout. Um, you'll see it's now sort of in the middle because um, for us at the health department, it is now part of what we will be doing for who knows how long. So we have had to really incorporate it into our routine work. Um, so it's, it's quite a heavy lift. Um, you'll see over the past fiscal year, we were over um, total from the beginning of the pandemic in March 2020 through June 30th, 2022, over 12,000 cases. Um, looking at the data up through last week in Milford, we're over 15,000 confirmed COVID-19 cases. Um, and also, as of last week, over uh, 210 deaths within the community. And then also reflected, I just always like to point out the number of um, just COVID-related phone calls. We get a lot of phone calls and a lot of walk-ins. Um, so just COVID alone for um, through June 30th, over 9,000 phone calls. And that's just the calls that were logged by our clerical staff. So that's not the calls that went to our sanitarians that went to our nurses, that went to our health educator. Um, so there's still a good amount of activity that's being handled by the health department in the area of COVID-19. And then um, the last two pages really cover the work of our Department of Human Services and Youth and Family Services. So, um, you know, what I'll say with, with those divisions is that uh, these divisions are really seeing the impact of the pandemic um, and a lot of the recovery work within our community. So people continue to be impacted um, by the pandemic economically. We're seeing more people in need of emergency rent, mortgage assistance, utility assistance. Um, there were many individuals that while there was a moratorium in place who um, did not pay their rent or their utilities, and then uh, when those things were lifted, 
they had uh, large balances that needed to be paid and um, some were laid off, some had employment issues. So our Department of Human Services outreach workers really work with um, the community on those issues. And we are definitely seeing um, people who we didn't see before, um, who are more um, on the edge. These are people, you know, um, working households who are just trying to make ends meet. Um, so I've included some information there on that. And then our youth and family services um, are really focusing on a lot of um, educational work within the community, webinars, um, collaborations with different community service organizations, and um, working really closely with the school social workers um, to identify ways to assist the schools in meeting some of the mental health and behavioral health challenges that the schools are facing and being able to supplement some of their work with programs in the community. So um, with that, in terms of the budget for the health department in particular, um, we have pretty much come in flat um, aside from contractual obligations and I'm happy to take any questions. Any questions for our health director, Alderman Gurman? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, through you, through Deepa and Joan, thanks for being here. Um, are all these positions filled currently? At the health department, yes, all of the positions are filled. Not, not with the nursing budget, but we're not there yet. Oh, okay, so we'll address that in a minute. So all these positions are filled? All of the health department positions are currently filled. Okay, thank you. Any more questions for the health department? Alderman Parente. Thank you. Thank you for the wonderful presentation again. It's so comprehensive and for all of your work escorting us through COVID and its aftermath. Um, I know in the ARPA plan there's a study uh, for a, a building, I believe. Can you update us on that? Yes, Thanks. absolutely. I'd be happy to. Um, one of the challenges that we have at the health department and human services is space. Um, I would invite anybody to, to come by and take a little tour and you will see that we are bursting at the seams um, in terms of um, places to put staff and to put stuff. Um, I think we've, we've used every nook and cranny and we find that um, when people walk through they're amazed at the things that we're able to have at the health department and human services but we have really outgrown our space um, and so through the ARPA funding we had put in a proposal um, for funding to support a new expanded space to really be able to conduct our operations um, in a way that makes sense. And so as part of that ARPA committee process, we were asked to conduct a feasibility study to determine really what the need is, what the appropriate square footage might be based on the functions of the health department and the human services department, as well as look at potential site selection. So um, we did put that project out to bid and we are um, in the middle of the feasibility study. We've gotten some estimates on square footage needs um, and are working through that site selection process. Uh, at this point, based on what we do and, what we, and the staff that we have, um, it's looking like we, just even looking at the space that we have at the health department on New Haven Avenue and the space over at Stern Hall on Gulf Street, we would need at least 50% more square footage than we currently have with those buildings combined. And also including, we have some storage space that we utilize over at Siemens Lane. So with all of those combined, we'd still need at least about 50% more space. Any more questions for the health department? Alderman Archiolo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, through you. Hi, Deepa. Hi, John. Um, I, I understand this year was a particularly late and particularly severe flu season. Um, and I just wanted to know um, how the health department estimates how many flu, like flu vaccines to order, uh, how many to store. And um, I, I'm just wondering how if you, because I, I, 
they don't keep very long and you can underestimate or overestimate how many to order. It seems like a very delicate thing to estimate and I just wanted to know how you navigate that process a bit. Sure. Um, the flu vaccine, we order our flu vaccine actually for the next flu season uh, now, well, actually about a month ago. Um, so we try to estimate really based on what we see in that given year. Um, what we, well, prior to this past year, what we were seeing was there was a bit of a trend of um, the flu vaccine was readily available in the community, whether it be at grocery stores, at pharmacies. And so we were starting to see a little bit of a trend where we were seeing decreasing flu numbers, flu vaccine numbers, and we were doing a study to determine um, how to potentially increase those numbers and just determining if people were getting their flu shot. Um, and what we found from that study was yes, but they were sometimes going to grocery stores, pharmacies, et cetera. This year changed that. We saw an increase in people coming to us because of the, um, the illness that was out there, and we were seeing that um, quote-unquote triple-demic of COVID, RSV, flu, and so, so we saw um, an uptick. So we really make our estimates based on what we see now for what we'll order next year. We go with a state contract um, to order that flu vaccine, and we are able to return any unused flu vaccine for credit for the following year. That's really good to know. I didn't know we could return them for credit. Um, thank you very much. Alderman Gurman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, through you. Um, just to kind of expand on that. So is it recommended that people get a flu shot and now also a COVID shot? every year or a couple times a year? So with flu vaccine, it is recommended that you get an annual flu shot. Um, and then with COVID, we are, we'll, we'll wait to see what happens in the fall for the next um, potential booster recommendation. At this time, actually last week, there were recommendations that came out um, around the bivalent va vaccine and so the discontinuing of the monovalent vac vaccine and recommendation that people get their bivalent vaccine if they have not, um, and then another schedule for, depending on age, for pediatrics. Um, and then also for individuals over the age of 65, it is, um, they can get another booster if they are um, four months out from their last booster. Um, that also, goes for immunocompromised individuals. But we will, we're waiting to see what the fall recommendations will be for COVID. And just one quick follow-up. Is there any adverse effects of the vaccines and are those being recorded? Or? So uh, for the COVID-19 vaccine, as with uh, and really any other vaccine, there is what's called the uh, VAERS reporting system. So it's where individuals are able to report any adverse reactions to any vaccine, and that is monitored through the federal government. And then if there's any adverse reactions, then we get that communication back from um, the CDC, the State Health Department Immunization Program, and can respond accordingly. At this point in time, the COVID-19 vaccine in particular um, is, is safe, um, and so there aren't concerns around the safety of the vaccine at this time. Okay, thank you. Any additional questions for the health department? I don't see any, but you're gonna be sticking around for the next department. Educational Health Services, School Nurses, page 95. Anyone having any questions for the Educational Health Services, School Nurses? Alderman Gurman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, through you. So are all these positions filled? They are not. We currently have um, one nursing vacancy, so um, there is a, a challenge, to say the least, in hiring nurses at this time. Um, we are experiencing the shortage that's out there. Um, so we, throughout the year, have had, uh, we have had maybe two, three weeks where we have been fully staffed. Um, but then 
we have had vacancies along the way, um, and they have been very, very challenging to fill. Um, it's, it's difficult to find nurses, and we are anticipating um, at least one retirement, if not more, at the end of the school year. So it, it's a challenge that we continue to try to be um, creative in our recruitment approach with HR, trying to get it out there to as many different places as possible. Um, and then that is something you will see reflected in the budget, is that um, the nurses did go through their contract negotiations um, over this past year. And we really looked at their contract to try to see if there were creative ways that we could make their position um, a little bit more attractive and be a little bit more competitive in the nursing field because um, when we look at wages relative to hospitals, um, it's difficult. So um, some of the increases that you'll see in the nursing budget are contractual obligations but that were um, negotiated in order to hopefully be able to attract good candidates. Do you think it's more wages or do you think there's just, there's just not a lot of applicants out there now or there's not enough schooling or what? I think it's a, it's a combination of the burnout that we're seeing in the field overall. Um, nurses are just really burnt out after the past three years and, and we've seen a bit of an exodus in the field. Um, but also, I think, um, you know, wages are a challenge and it's a particular sort of situation, I think, when we think about a 10-month school nurse position and being able to, there's a beauty to that and having, you know, the summers off and vacations, but financially you have to be able to, to balance that as well. So I think it's a little bit of a combination of both. Any more questions relating to educational health services, school nurses? Alderman Marlowe. Uh, just a quick question through you, Chairman. Uh, hi, Deepa. Uh, just wondering with the educational bonuses, I see that went up a lot. Um, I guess what happened? <laughs> yeah, that, that is um, one of the areas where um, during negotiations, Previously, um, they had in their contract an educational bonus based on if they had a bachelor's, a bachelor's in nursing, a master's, a master's in nursing. And so those stipend amounts um, were increased through the negotiations process. Okay, thank you. Any more questions regarding the educational health services, school nurses? I don't see any. So on your, the last department for Deepa Joseph is the Human Services Department. And it's page 95, 90, so Human Services, page 90. I just want to say, Deepa, we are in the city of Milford, very fortunate to have you and your staff keeping the city residents and their businesses safe and healthy these past few years. I just want to compliment you on the job you've been doing. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have a separate presentation for human services or you want to just continue questions? I do not. I'm happy to take any questions. The budget is flat and there is information in your booklet on uh, our services. Yeah, we'll just say anybody have any questions regarding human services? I don't, oh. Thank you. Alderman Parenti. Thank you, Chairman. Could you just give us a little summary of, um, are you seeing any significant differences uh, post-COVID in terms of what the needs are of youth and family in our community and how that's approached? Thank you. Um, I don't necessarily think it's differences, but more so um, exacerbations of what was already there. Um, and so uh, in terms of volume of requests for emergency assistance, emergency financial assistance, um, we are seeing that. If you actually, if you look in your booklet under human services, there's a little pie chart of financial assistance provided years ago the human services portion of that was 
really minor, and it was more relying on some of our community agencies to be able to support that. Um, over the past few years, we've worked really hard to obtain grant funding to be able to um, support the financial assistance needs of the community in emergencies, and so um, that increase really reflects some of the, the increase in volume of requests that we're receiving. Um, and on the youth and family services side, again, I think an, ex an exacerbation of what was already there in terms of some of the mental health needs that we're seeing uh, among kids and families. Any questions for the Human Services Department? I don't see any. Thank you, and thank you for this thank you. really great presentation and giving us this handout. It's very, very, very informative. Thank, thank you. you. Next department on our agenda this evening is the Government Access Television. Ms. Cara Flannery. Page 16. Good evening. Thank you for having me and thank you for um, serving the city of Milford and being the stars of MGAT. Um, we have a um, two channels. We're a little bit unique in Milford in that we, we run two channels, both education and government, whereas um, Orange really just focuses on government. You know, I really like the idea that we, we, we are really the one place where everything comes together and um, we really try to make government accessible. Um, we cover about 100 meetings per year, um, Board of Education, for uh, uh, Zoning Board of Appeals, Planning and Zoning. Uh, in my tenure, we've also uh, resumed uh, Milford Inland Wetlands. We're covering that meeting. Board of Finance during the budget season. Um, we've also added planning, uh, the plan for conservation and development. Um, that's a really important meeting as they discern our plan for the future, so we, we started adding those this year. And we also really like to do some community events because it's really fun. It also helps bring our community together. Um, in 2019, we started adding graduations because, as you know, we invest a lot in our schools and our students, and we really wanted the whole community to really celebrate um, the graduation ceremonies, and they, they are very, very popular broadcasts. It's really fun to see. Um, students um, sharing graduation with their grandparents that aren't in, in the city, so um, in our town. Uh, but it was really fun. We also added the Law Foreign Football game. That's always a really, really fun event. Um, um, we've had over 2,000 views on some of these community events, so we know they're really popular and they're uh, just a nice value add um, that we've been doing the inauguration ceremony, Mayor's Youth Awards. So. Um, that's, that's what we, we try to do, and um, if you have any questions, I want to thank you for your patience. This past year has been a big year of transition for us in our equipment. We, we were running the channels off of file servers, which had, um, we've learned, sort of an end-of-life issues around four years. Um, so as they were starting to phase out, um, we had a few interruptions in service on the channel. Our YouTube was always really solid. But as we were transitioning into new units, um, we, um, w you know, there was there was a period where our educational channel was at color bars, and but now we're in a really good spot. We have one new file server which is actually operating both channels, so we're able to do. We this this equipment comes to us through grant funding. We used to have one file server at Parsons, one file server at Town Hall. Now we have one file server in Town Hall that actually operates both channels. And what it can do is really amazing. If we are streaming in the field, let's say we are um, at Veterans Memorial Auditorium doing an event there. It used to be that we could stream it, but we couldn't send it to the channel. And now with this new system, we actually send everything to the cloud first, whether it's in Town Hall, whether it's in Parsons, and then from the cloud, it gets syndicated to YouTube and to the channel at the same time. And we're, we're even doing this with some of our Zoom meetings now. So um, it, we're, we, we're very conscious of the fact that not everybody likes YouTube. And so uh, trying to pay attention and be mindful that those interruptions of service really matter to people. It's just sometimes it, it takes a lot longer to, to address those issues with, you know, obtaining the equipment, getting an installer, getting, getting somebody here. So I just want to thank you for your patience, but um, 
we're finally sort of at the end of a long road this year with, with that work. So, and I, I'll take any questions you have. So, so I'm hearing that all the wiring difficulties and technical issues you were having have all been resolved? Yes, I, yes, 100%. Um, in the recent few meetings, I did get a few calls from people. We had um, little blips in the meetings. Well, you, you might have noticed where like it seemed to switch to something. And we, we figured out that when we were installed, we installed the file server and there were really three hands in that process. There was, you know, the, one, of the, one of our former installers who was reconfiguring our old setup to the new setup. There was the original installer. And then we had, um, we realized with the new equipment that it was no longer compatible with the optimum transmitter. And that was a big headache that we, we had to address. So with all those three hands, um, it's a two-channel file server, and it was switching over to programming at certain points, and we've sort of resolved that issue. So everything stays in its lane, and we don't interrupt live programming. Those were two settings that we sort of had to address. But it was new equipment, and we were still learning how to use it. And so um, broadcast, any, anything that has to do with streaming or broadcast, it's one of those things where you have to follow every single step in production, if you miss one check mark, if you miss one button, something's going to go awry. And we were still trying to figure, you know, we were still learning that process. So we have, uh, I, 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 I follow it religiously now and make sure everything is, is working. And so far, so good, no problems this week, so. Do, do you ever have to edit any of these programs? <laughs> No, um, the... Well, our meetings get to be a little, you know, uh, not smooth as we would like. And I was just wondering if you had a little editing going on there. So the live video, what the beauty of this is that there is no editing. We, we used to be, in our prior system, before we had file servers, somebody would broadcast the meeting and then they would have to encode it and format it for the server, and that was hours. We were spending money on, a lot more money on labor. Now, what is the beauty of this system is that once you, you're live editing, we're switching cameras right now, depending upon who's speaking, and then at the end of the meeting, they walk away, and there's no more work to do. There's nothing else to pay for. Um, the only thing that we have to do is go into the we have to sort of set up the programming, which is sort of just a little bit of administrative work where you go in and you, you put the times in on the channel, you might put up some slides or something in between the programming, but um, it's, um, it's actually much, 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 much more simpler. Um, if, if when we're, when the only kind of editing I think that we do do is when we have the law for and football game, we do a nice little pre-show which is kind of fun. We do little interviews with the coaches and, you know, how you doing? Are you, you know, a little, little, uh, we do like a little half hour pregame. It's kind of fun with the athletic departments and stuff. Thank you for working that out. Any questions for Emga? Alderman Marlowe. <laughs> Hi, Kara. Hi, how are you? Um, because I sit as liaison on, um, I know the hard work that you put into this, but I'm looking at the budget here and I see the cable service from what you requested to what was approved is, you know, significantly less. I know you run on a really tight budget as it is. What will this mean to you? Well, just keep in mind, I, I usually don't ask for a lot, you know, that, um, this, uh, this was very unusual for me, for me to ask this much. Um, and one of the reasons is that um, in the last year, we brought on a new managing producer and um, a new technical producer. And it's sort of like my dream team. You know, they, um, they are so good and they have, um, I, 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 as a chair with, with some of the previous staff, I really had to do a lot of the day-to-day -day managing myself. And, you know, that's really not sustainable, you know, over time for a committee to be, like, calling up, you know, when something's wrong or how do I do this? And, you know, um, it, it really needs to, the committee really needs to serve as oversight and planning and you have somebody run it day-to-day. -day. And we're, we are able to, we're, we're managing. 
but they're so amazing and they, they came to our, when we were at our meeting to discuss the budget, they came with this presentation that was so beautiful and had so much vision and um, they had compared what we are spending here in Milford versus what other towns are in the Area 2 Cable Advisory Council, which is sort of this group. Um, where other towns like uh, Fair, Fairfield was at like 73,000, OGAD is at um, 70,000, and they're filming everything. You know, they're doing police and fire, they're doing library, they're doing community events. And, you know, I don't know how every commission feels about being live on camera. You know, some are actually a little resistant. You know, they don't necessarily want the whole world to see, but we would really like to cover more if there is community interest. And so, also because I, I these two, these two are so great. I just wanted to bring their vision and, and the committee was behind it and said, let's just see what happens. And, but you know, it wasn't the year and um, that's, you know, we, look, I've been at all these budget hearings, I know. <laughs> but that's really the story of how that, um, how that took place, how, why, why we, we went so high. We just have a really good team this year. Really happy to work with them. Thank you, Pam. Alderman Vitale. Thank you, Mr. Chair, through you. Kara, thank you for the advances in the technology over the years because it's a, it's a really big difference. Uh, and since you don't do any editing, and I don't know what data collection you have, but can you tell us what the most popular show is? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I'm curious myself. Oh, what do you mean, the most popular meeting? Or what? Show. <laughs> meeting. <laughs> okay, well, I mean, hands down the football games. I mean, like I said, 2,000 people. I mean, it's, it's that, the football games, so that, that we would have 2,000 people watching the law foreign football game, like it was that popular. Um, the, um, uh, the, I'll, I'll give you a quick overview. If you, if you know, one thing I've actually tried to get this information, they, they don't really have it, they don't really share it. So I've actually tried to find out, we have, we have a representative at Optimum who comes to the Area 2 Cable Advisory Council meetings. And I really wanted to know like how many subscribers do we have in Milford who are getting government access on Optimum and Frontier? How many people have cut the cord and are just watching on YouTube and they don't have to share that information and they never will. So I've always wondered, you know, it's usually anecdotal, like I ask people, do you watch us on YouTube or do you watch us on TV? And almost everybody has, it's hard for me to find committee members that actually have government access. But anyway, to answer your question, so there are people that are watching, and I don't have information on the TV watchers, but for YouTube, so our education channel actually has 826 subscribers. Our uh, government channel has 472 subscribers. And um, the, the meetings themselves, I mean, the, the Board of Ed meetings get lately like 900 to 1,000 views, you know, on, on M and the, the city meetings, it depends. I think your budget hearings are very popular. Um, you know, they can, they can be like, you know, 900 views as well. Some of the regular meetings are only like 20 views, you know, or 15 views. But your, um, but all of that information is on YouTube. It's all publicly available. Like if you go, you'll see how many. You, you know, Thank you. I guess we just have to work harder to be more popular. Thank you. Pardon me. I think we just have to work harder at the board of aldermen meetings to be more popular. No, I mean, it's it, also. I, I will say, I would love to see a higher viewership. That's also part of our mission. And um, we did create a Facebook page and are trying to share meetings out. Um, one of the things we hope to do is have a website where we can have a little bit more two-way. Um, like if you, if there's something you want to see, you send us a request. You know, we we have we have a form out there. Nobody's used it to say, you know, can you come to my meeting or event? You know. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> yes. Yes, uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, to Alderman Vitelli, I think you are the most popular person <laughs> on MDAP. Okay, so you are the most popular more, person. Is there an increase in salary on that? <laughs> Any more questions for MGAT? Alderman Gurman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, through you, and to Kara. Um, is there any way to um, reap some benefits of this large viewership. Can we sell ads or <laughs> commercials? You know, there is, I could look into it if, if it, I don't know if I allowed to. I don't, I, I, I mean. Sure you are. The, 
The, um, um, I know that YouTube, we don't pay for YouTube, right? So it's not our platform. And that actually comes with some pluses and minuses to it. Um, because we don't pay for it, they actually serve up ads to the viewers. Um, um, so, you, you know, if you, before you watch a meeting, you might see an ad. Um, if, I think I have to have a higher, I think I have to get up to like a thousand subscriptions before I can participate in some of that revenue sharing of, of it, but. Um, yeah, I thought there was some kind of revenue share, but yeah, like it, might, it might be much more yeah, it's viewership. Like pennies, but yeah. Like hundreds um, of thousands or something. Yeah, but, um, yeah. Alderman Parente. Thank you, three of chairman. Thank you for you, yours and your team's hard work. Uh, I know there have been late nights with us and Blessing's been here, so thank you so much for that. This was a fairly significant amount that you did not receive mm -hmm. um, in the mayor and then the Board of Finance budget. Will that uh, impact your coverage going no. forward? No, no okay. not at all. And in fact, we did get an increase, so okay. I'm, I'm grateful for that. Of like, uh, uh, I think it was um, like a, a small increase. So you know, we'll hopefully add something this year. We'll Good. try to. I'm open to like any ideas. We we really love feedback. Like sometimes people call me up and say, you know, there was an issue with this, and you know, we sometimes we don't know until you tell us, or mm -hmm. sometimes we don't know there's an important, significant event until you tell us. So again, we we. You know, we had a big dream, but uh, our big vision, but we, we are going to move forward a little bit this year, so okay, I'm, I am happy. Yeah, I love your idea of building interactivity with the community. You know, Pardon me? The, building interactivity through the website with the oh, community, yeah, engaging yeah, yeah. the community, letting them yeah. know about things. That's terrific, so yeah. thank you. There's, and, and we're trying to add like a community calendar, and but again, all this is on the channel, and so I have to be realistic about how much how much time, energy, money are we going to put into a cable channel when people are really heading over to YouTube? And um, all of, you know, they're getting content from all over, you know, all over the place now. So, but yeah. Any more questions for MGAT? Seeing none, thank you, Kara. Thank you. thank you for your presentation and your patience with us. Well, and thank you for your patience with me. Got it. The next department on our agenda is the finance department, Mr. Peter Iridishi. Thank you, Chairman Vitro, to members of the, through you to the members of the Board of Aldermen. I'd like to begin by just uh, saying thank you for all your support of the, the various divisions and offices of the finance department, which include accounting, treasury payroll, the assessor, the tax office, purchasing, the office of finance director, and technically also the information technology uh, department or division um, are all part of finance. And as you can imagine, with all of these offices and with how the city continues to work on projects, add new projects, apply for more grants, it has placed increased demand uh, on us. And also, as, as you're aware, as a board, with the challenges that all of the departments face, again, that rolls into our department, and we do the best that we can to assist and support all the city departments. And we are, I'd like to say, uh, the lifeblood of the city because we really deal with everyone. And everyone looks to us for support, for expertise, for advice, um, and, and we are there. We are there to train, to answer questions, and to make sure that we are in compliance um, with all of the various rules and regulations that govern us. It, looking back at the last fiscal year, uh, the past audit took a bit longer, and that's because we have a lot more grants, and that includes the Board of Education as well. And so that took us, and, and especially the auditors, more time to complete the audit for fiscal year 22. We've also had, it, it seems to be the norm now, that every year the Governmental Accounting Standards Board requires us to implement a new standard. Uh, the past fiscal year was GASB 87, which dealt with 
not capital leases, which we've always reported on, but operating leases. And, and these included everything from the, the small copier leases to any type of lease on the city and Board of Education side had to be looked at, had to be inventoried and analyzed for reporting under GASB 87. That was a huge project for us. And now as we begin to work on the 22-23 audit, we have to implement GASB 96, which deals with uh, subscription-based information technology agreements. So again, um, we have to work with the Board of Ed and the city departments to compile all of this information. As, and you can imagine it, it does require more labor, more time, more resources, more complexity. The staff of our departments work very hard. They're very dedicated and focused. Uh, we've dealt with some turnover, as, as you may have heard in the past, but we've done a good job at replacing those positions. Um, our new treasurer, uh, Lucia Branco, has, has done a great job. Um, she uh, continues um, to make progress. She hasn't quite completed a full year, but she's doing very well. Um, our payroll supervisor, Judy Keeler, retired also. Uh, not too long ago, and her successor, Margaret Soukas, has, has also done very well in making sure that office continues to do a great job with the city payroll. And I would also add that, you know, as we continue to move forward, we, we do look forward to working with uh, the new mayor, Richard Smith, and with all of the challenges that lie ahead. And again, we all appreciate the support because we know it's always been there over the years. I'll now pivot to the budget itself and looking at it, um, like many of the other departments, it's relatively flat. Uh, the increase is primarily due to contractual obligations. We made some slight adjustments uh, where warranted. And with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Alderman Vitale. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Three. Thank you, Peter, for your your guidance in all of the numbers and and and, mo and moving in whatever you do with those numbers that they come out. <laughs> the other thing is, um, could you help me ex explain the vehicle and equipment upkeep and the propellants? gas and propellants? Yes, Mr. Chairman, through you. That, that is for the assessor's office, for the uh, assessor and deputy assessors to go out to do field inspections. Thank you. Alderman German. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, through you, through Peter. Thank you for all the good work you do, Peter. Um, are all these positions filled? Through you, Mr. Chairman, Alderman Gurman, no, we, we currently have two vacancies, uh, Clerk A in the tax office and another Clerk A in the assessor office that are vacant. And are we actively looking or? Yes, uh, the tax office um, has been actively looking and, and we were on the cusp of um, almost filling it, but again, we, uh, as you know, implemented the hiring freeze, so we've hit the pause button on that. And in the assessor's office, we had an existing in clerk A who was relatively new, um, but sh after uh, coming back or almost coming back from her maternity leave, she decided to uh, to resign and, and step down. So we have that vacancy that was just recently created. So we will also uh, actively look to fill that one, um, and especially after the hiring freeze is lifted. Thank you. Alderman Beatty. Through you, Chairperson Vitro, thank you. Hello, Peter, and I reiterate and echo everybody's appreciation of you and the staff and the scope of uh, finances throughout the city. Um, we rely on you. In fact, we're, we're maybe thinking that we should have you monthly as our report to the Aldermanic Board so that we uh, know what is happening. 
um, you brought up the the freezes, and we're trying. We're, we're dealing with the budget. Some departments aren't that affected. Others, it's a great impact. So we're coming later tonight to Public Works. It seems to be more of an impact. You only have two clerks that are affected, but you did tell us last year that you're at capacity. There's new demand. In fact, in the beginning of your presentation tonight, you expanded on new demand by the Gasby re regulation, et cetera. So does the fiscal, fiscal control, we didn't know about those wage holdings until we were already, until we were just about to start the budget. So do those emanate from your office? What are the drivers for the fiscal control? And if so, might you have told us earlier, or does this come from administration? And then the same question. And what do we do with it now? Um, is it true? I'm looking at a budget book. We have a budget before us with the hold on positions and the hold on requisitions. Are we looking at less money and fewer positions in the booklet than when we started it for? So, if a department is getting what you are, 800,000, it really isn't because there are two positions or 10 positions not, not filled. And also, for the rest of the year, there's going to be requisitions. And requisitions, if I'm understanding it, can be pens and yellow pads, and requisitions can be larger items to execute the thing. And how do we know that? And what do we do with it? Through you, Mr. Chairman, to Alderman Beatty, um, I'll begin with the first part of your question, questioning uh, with how, do, how did we get to the spending controls memo. It's, it's something that traditionally the city has done, especially as we approach the spring season with at least three to four months before the end of the current fiscal year. Uh, with the departments and especially my office, we, we look at where we're at for the current year and try to project where we'll be for expenses incurred up to June 30th. And, you know, when we see that um, there may be some challenges with not attaining enough of a, let's say, um, you, know, you want to end up in the black, so to speak, and you want to have a surplus uh, to cover um, what needs to be covered in, the, in each budget book. And, and so when, when I looked at, um, and the mayor mentioned this in his previous comments, uh, especially looking at the situation, what really forced our hand was the um, culmination of those seven employee groups that settled their contracts all at once, all in this given year, at the same, almost at the same time. And how the benefit salary reserve um, had um, approximately close to two million for the general fund in reserve, but the cost of the retroactive increases um, was approximately three million. So there was a million shortfall that had to be covered through the budget that you adopted uh, for 22-23. And so you'll see on Monday uh, with the budget memo transfer that is being put forward to you for review, that we had to dip into accounts um, as best as we could. Um, and my concern was, well, we normally, if we dip into some of these accounts, it was to cover other shortfalls um, in other city departments approaching year-end. And normally, in the past, we've made it through fine. Um, but now, we were covering retro increases as opposed to shortfalls that might be in public works or in fire, for example. And so that's when I called the mayor and said, look, we, um, just from my vantage point, we need to tap the brakes and implement a spending controls memo because if we do nothing, that would be worse. Um, we have to take some action to mitigate this challenge and um, hope that we end up in a good position for year end. But again, I'll be clear there, it's still a challenge, and, um, even with the spending controls in place. I'll then clarify the purchase requisitions that it's not a complete freeze. Obviously, city operations have to continue. Um, what we had asked the departments and, and my office and the mayor's office to do is to just carefully 
review as we normally would each requisition, but anything that was um, um, not as urgent, if it could be deferred to the new year if possible, we've asked departments to do that, to lower the encumbrances or requisitions. But we are still doing requisitions. And then this, the hiring freeze, as you can imagine, we're trying to get savings there too, again, to help cover potential shortages in other accounts, um, particularly in fire and public works. Thank you. Thank you for that full explanation. It actually is exactly as I understood it, but to hear you say it is helpful. I only think of five contracts, police, fire, public works, education, and the uh, city administrative services, and you said six. Who's the other one? Um, the others um, are non-reps that, like there are non-reps that follow the Milford Employees Association. Um, there are non-reps like the police chief and deputy police chief that, um, followed the police union contract, that's settled. So that's where I get my number, because as we deal with the payroll and going through it, we have to go through each group. And so um, technically, there's more than just the, the, the union contracts. You have the non-reps uh, that are affected as well. The other thing uh, is that uh, in other years, or if there weren't six contracts, there were three, we might have absorbed that extra need better. It came to a crisis, I hate to use that word, when for education it was so great. And then, if you meet that and address that and recognize that it was contractually caused, you almost have to take it out of other departments which are experience the same need. So that's, that's the uh, dilemma that we're in now. And it's not about blame. I think we're all sitting here trying to solve this and we, want, and we all want to look good. We all want to look, you know, this is not a blame or, or anything. In other years, we've been stellar in our fiscal minding of the public purse. But are the knots too tight now to get it out of saving and fiscal control such as wage? And how, how will we, or, and, and then we should have had the, this information before. Maybe that is a blame. I'm lying. Uh, we should have, we're the ones who are doing this budget. And so uh, uh, we're thinking, or, I mean, Alderman Gorman asked, Alderman Marlowe asked, is that position filled? If not, why not? And thinking, will it be filled and can it be filled? You know, so I mean, that's what we're doing. So we need to ask these probing questions. We're not looking to say, why did it happen? But now that it happened, what's the fix? And is the only fix to just hope that we make it to the June 30th with these tight restrictions? Or can we alleviate it in some way, Peter? And can you help us in a way, you know, dare I say it, I'll get tomatoes thrown at me, but if you raised the mill rate a half a percentage and gave us a formula, what would that do to free up? And then what would it do to the revenue stream? Or 1% and keep, still keep it under 28 and 29, but fiddle with it a little bit and say that we had inflation and we had six contractual obligations that with retroactive bonuses are taking a, a toll. And I, I, I hate to give the message to the public, you know, it's the labor costs, it's the retroactive bonuses, as if the employee is at fault here getting more than they deserve. Those were delayed contracts, were they not? And some of that's the reason. Anyway, help us out, please. Through you, Mr. Chairman, to Alderman Beatty. Um, Yes, it, it, I don't want to assign blame either, and, and, and definitely don't want the public to think that um, you know the blame has to do with the retros. I mean that that is a that that is not the case. Um, but as part of those contracts too, um, you know, it, when we do an estimate, we don't know what's going to be finally negotiated. Um, so that's another factor. It's not just that all of them settled at once, that's one component, but also we're not privy to the final uh, settlement, if you will, which um, sometimes not just, doesn't just include the, um, 
annual wage increase, but it could include reclassification of positions as well. But, but pardon me, we were told, I thought the alderman, that there was a reserve account for just that contingency, that if the contract settled at a higher rate or more, that we had saved and not spent on wages because of the delayed contract, and so that we would have that, no? Yes, that, that is true. Um, but again, it is an estimate. Um, in my mind, I always like to, um, in estimating at a cushion or, or estimate more, um, but as this board knows, each and every year, um, we're doing our best to keep the budget as lean as possible. To, we're looking at the mill rate, for example, and so that's you know, part of the pressure, too, um, that we can't always add um, a cushion, if you will, for contingency, um, because we don't know certain things that will end up being settled. Um, so that is a, a challenge year, year over year. Um, but I would agree that this concern has to do with the current fiscal year and the budget you've adopted for 23 is set. Um, so I and the, and the administration will have to work with you to deal with um, any potential problem with 23. Um, but I would agree that with that said, it should be part of our discussions or your discussions for 23-24 to see how, how, if we need to do better um, in the next budget to, uh, to kind of um, um, mitigate something like this happening uh, for next year. And thank you, and thank you for not seeing it as an intrusion. It's the work we have to do to complete this 23 budget. Then lastly, if I hear you right, suppose, like I was thinking, why not lift, rescind the, the wage, the, the position hold and the requisition, you're saying that wouldn't be enough. So we have to be, uh, discuss the other possibilities. Yes, we would have to be open to other possibilities once we get closer to the final results. We are now uh, at the end of April. We have May and June, two months of expenditures uh, to go through, and we're not done paying bills until, you know, sometimes the end of August, uh, early September. So um, definitely we will have to, um, you would have to stay tuned to see uh, what the results end up being. Thank you. Thank you, and I won't take up any more of your time, other people. Thank you. Any more questions for the Finance Department? Alderman Parente. Thank you, through you, Chairman. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you so much for the work of your department. I, I often hear through the community great things about, um, and the city employees, about the work that <clears throat> your employees do. Uh, to Alderman Beatty's point, are there any, is there any tapping of the brakes on any projects that are ongoing or getting started that might not be in our awareness? And how is that kind of effectuated? Um, just to ensure that kind of holistically, um, anywhere that there needs to be um, tightening up is being done so. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Chairman Taldman Parente, I, I am not aware of any tapping of the brakes on projects I have not heard of that uh, at this point. So to my knowledge, a bit the city, uh, uh, the business of the city continues. Thank you. Any more questions for the finance department? I don't see any. They, Alderman Ginotazio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening through, through you. Um, Peter, once again, thank you for all the work that you do and we know that you're an expert in your field. Have you received any indication of what our state reimbursement might be coming for this budget that we are now deliberating? Through you, Mr. Chairman, I, I did receive preliminary estimates and those were used for the mayor's budget as well as the Board of Finance budget. Uh, but since the Board of Finance, I've heard a uh, few presentations on what we might expect, but no hard numbers. Uh, we're waiting for 
the legislature um, to complete their process with the governor and also staying in touch with CCM. Um, they've promised us to get us updated estimates as soon as possible, but as of today, I, I have no update yet. And Mr. Chairman, through you, just to expand on that, through you to Alderman Giantasio, we checked as recently as today to see if they had town runs from the Appropriation and Finance Committee. Uh, they do not. Uh, we checked with OFA, Office of Fiscal Analysis, and we checked with CCM. Uh, they just don't have those figures available yet. Okay, and one last question through you, Mr. Chairman. Do we have an idea when, what day we have reserved dates of when we're going to vote to adopt the budget? Is there a date that's going to be announced? We have uh, four dates reserved, May 10th, May 11th, May 17th, and May 18th. I'm sorry, we also have May 3rd and May 4th. So six dates that are reserved. Uh, I likely will not be with you. But uh, I can tell you what we've done historically is we wait to get a better sense from the state to see approximately how much we're going to be receiving so we can have something more definitive to put into that revenue line item or those line items uh, that reflect state funding. Uh, as I've said in the past, when I started this uh, budgeting, 20 years ago, approximately 15% of Milford's revenue came from the state. Now, about 5%, less than 5% comes from the state of Connecticut. We're hoping this year is going to be better than that. And uh, we always hope. Thank you, Mayor Blake. And I know you will be here in spirit, and uh, you will certainly be greatly missed. Thank you. I appreciate that, and I'm always happy to take calls or questions anytime you have my cell phone number. Chairman, just through you to Alderman Parente. Thank you. Through you to um, Alderman James Hasio. I think what I understand about the Appropriations Committee that there's spending caps um, that are in statute now, and they're attempting to get loosen up, I think, about $300 million or more to divert out of that, and they're trying to um, bump up the municipal grant and aid amounts, if that's helpful. Maybe we'll hear about that soon. Thank you for the update, and it uh, sounds like uh, there's a possibility we could get more money. Okay. Any more questions for the Finance Department? <clears throat> Hearing none, thank you, Peter. Thank you and your staff for the great job you do for the city of Milford year after year. And we're very aware of the awards you get every year. It's, it's a pleasure to have you on board. Thank you again. The next department on our agenda is the Milford Arts Council. Paige Maggio. Magillo. Good evening, everyone. My name is Paige Milio. I'm the Executive Director of the Milford Arts Council. We are finishing up our 50th se season serving the City of Milford and my 10th year as Director. Um, I'm presenting our budget to you a little differently this year. Um, you have our budget that we presented to the Mayor from the year prior, and um, I'm giving you a very, very truncated version of the budget, which shows our total revenue of $282,000 um, split into unearned income of two hundred and fifteen seven dollars and earned income of $67,000, and expenses of $282,334, and that's separated in all expenses and personnel with a net of $425. Um, it's important to share with you this picture of us, a snapshot, because the gift that we are so graciously um, 
except from the city of Milford, and it is phenomenal that a municipality supports their arts organization and have for many, many years um, of $70,000. When I started, it was $70,000. Um, I, actually, I think it was down to 67 or $65,000. It was about a third of our budget. Um, since I've been here, we've grown our working budget to about $75,000, $80,000 more than when I started. Um, we have increased, since um, in the past three years, increased salaries, wages, and number of staff this year. We received a grant of $20,000 for this fiscal year and next from the Community Foundation for Greater New Haven, and we are gambling on um, increasing our earned revenue, which is basically um, ticketed events. Um, ticketed events, as you can see, is a very small portion of what we earn as the Milford Arts Council. The main presentation that I have given you, which is called the Community Forward versus MAC Run Events, those are basically community events that we charge nobody for. It is free for the community against MAC run or ticketed events. Um, we start at the very top with the DECD Public Art Grant Project, which was awarded to us in 2019. That is at the top of community engagement because that is a constant. It exists in our community. Those five benches were um, positioned and installed throughout downtown this past spring in May and June, and they will exist as long as they physically exist. To be enjoyed by our community, they are accessible 24-7. Um, it put money into the hands of creatives during the pandemic, which we are very, very proud of. We have the Sand Sculpture Contest, which is our longest running event. It's in its 46th year. It's at Walnut Beach. We have upwards of um, two to 5,000 people who attend this event. People um, plan their vacations to Milford based upon the date, and the date shifts every single year based upon the tide. So this year it's on a Sunday in early July, which has some people upset um, because of church services. It's in the morning, and I said that we too um, answer to a higher power. <laughs> God and Mother Nature sets the tides, not the Milford Arts Council. Um, we have now taken on two or th two new public-facing events. One is Porch Fest, which was begun in a collaboration of the Milford Arts Council and Economic Development Commission um, about, I think, I want to say five years ago. It uh, stopped for a couple of years during COVID, and it is now um, fully under the ownership and running of the Milford Arts Council. It does have a very hardworking volunteer committee, um, but that is most likely the volunteers will be there for as long as the volunteers are there. So at some point in time, we'll probably be taking over a lot of the workings of that event. The Holiday Buoy Tree, which was mentioned during Jim's presentation at Lisbon Landing, was a community project um, brought to us by board member Michaela Silva, and uh, we had our second year this past year. Um, this is an interesting event because it was begun um, during the pandemic, and so many people in the community wanted to take part and participate. Um, we sold buoys to families, individuals, artists, and businesses to decorate and be hung, and um, Last year and this year, we have a large proportion of buoys that were not picked up by the community. So we probably have about 150, 200 buoys that are already painted, that are stored in boxes, that do not biodegrade, so we can't throw them away. Um, so we're a little at a crossroads to see how that event will continue, quite honestly, into the future. Um, our One Act Play Fest, hosted by uh, Eastbound, Theater, Max Community Theater Group, and in partnership with the Westport Community Theater uh, has happened every single year. That's an amazing event, and we moved it during COVID to the um, outdoor um, small field behind the three houses of the Historical Society, and it's gained quite a lot of popularity. People enjoy bringing their chairs and seeing the original plays. 
We are crossing our fingers that um, we will be presenting um, our first Shakespeare in the Park at Eisenhower in August for Midsummer's Night Dream. Then we move on to MAC hosted opportunities for community engagement in the arts. These are more like clubs or um, meetings that happen monthly uh, for a certain particular uh, community in the arts to uh, network and work together to um, grow their craft. So we have a writer's group, we have New England Guitar Society for classical guitarists, we have artist to artist for our visual artists, um, we have utilized the Firehouse Gallery for pop-up exhibits, which is um, a very small charge for a three-day rental for artists to actually own the space as their own shop or exhibit. So they run, they curate the show, they run gallery hours, and they keep 100% of sales. Um, we have our open mic, which has gained a great deal of popularity. It provides um, a wonderful professional stage for uh, performers of all types to um, hone in their craft and to try things out on audiences. We're also starting a new community opportunity for um, new plays with Plays in Development, which is a staged reading of brand new works, again with Eastbound Theater. And then we have our collaborative events and um, reaching out to new communities. We have started this year and last year with a all ages, all inclusive events, which have taken place both at the MAC and the Firehouse Gallery. Uh, we have a curated exhibit coming up this fall with um, tattoos and the art and experience of tattoos and storytelling. We are working with a uh, Tai Chi master for a family event um, in the fall in Eisenhower Park. Uh, we have been partnering with Room 17 um, for an exhibit program, which they started this year and want to continue and grow. We're now partnering with the School of Rock for their recitals. We hosted a fundraiser for Beth L this year called Pass the Guitar, which has um, been slated to become an annual partnership and event. And we're looking for outside producers to bring in new programs, um, small concerts, for new music with Tiny, Do Tiny Box Productions, Ubuntu Stories, etc., And then we have our typical MAC produced events. These are the ticketed events. Eastbound Theater produces three main stage productions. Um, the One Act Play Fest, the plays in the park, and the plays in development. Our exhibits, we host six to eight MAC run exhibits between the two venues. And we host um, eight to 12 concerts every single year, focusing on many, many different music genres. This year we're gonna be working, which was a goal for our gala, to develop new family programming. So we hope to produce and present um, three to five programs that would be focused on families with young children. And then our endowment uses their money for um, small mini grants, as well as scholarships. So, uh, when we talk about the 220 events that we host every single year, this is what they look like. This is, again, why I thought that the snapshot of our budget was important to understand what we actually run that makes us money versus what we have to rely on, donations, membership, the city of Milford, and grants. So I've also included flyers for the upcoming events that are still left in our calendar, including our fundraiser on May 18th. So um, hopefully some of you want to come out and enjoy some of our events or the fundraiser, that would be appreciated. So if there's any questions, I would be happy to answer them. Is there any questions for the Milford Arts Council? Alderman Gurman. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Chairman, through you to Paige. Thank you for all your great work you do over there at the MAC. Um, where is the tasting and grazing festival? That will take place at the MAC. Oh, at the MAC? Yes. Are you doing that annual or that thing you had at the um, Lisbon Landing? Landing? Yeah. So that um, amazing event was our 50th anniversary gala. Um, and it was a true gala. And um, 
I think an event like that happens at important events, so our important milestones. So 50 years was, I think, a good opportunity to put on fancy clothes and get dressed up and, and um, pay a high ticket price, which I know made some of our followers a little upset that we weren't being accessible, which was the other reason to make this list happen. Um, when people look at our events and our tickets, and uh, we have had some comments that we're not as accessible as perhaps we should be. So it was important to kind of lay out the ground for understanding everything that we do that is free for everybody and anybody in and around Milford. Um, but the large event at the gal for the gala um, is probably the only one that I will see in my tenure. So the next milestone celebration will be somebody else's. Well, that's a shame because that was a great event. And it, was it was a, a fabulous it, event. It, it was nicely set up down there, and it was, yeah, I thought it was really, really good. So, thank you. Thank you. Any additional questions for the Milford Arts Council? Alderman Parente. Thank you, Chairman. Um, it's not so much a question, but just thank you for <clears throat> what you do for our community. You are a true asset and um, people come from all over to enjoy uh, what you provide and um, we've been longtime fans of of you so thank you thank you very much and alderman german just another one quick uh, through you uh, chairman um, what is your membership fee annual fee and how do people join so anybody can join um, you can sign up for emails and not join you can join for as little as $35 as an artist member. It is truly an art and membership for artists. So the perks that you get is um, a welcome to the annual meeting and um, perks for submission fees uh, to exhibits. Um, a patron membership, and it's called the patron membership, starts at $50 a year. And then it moves up from that and has um, various discounts or free tickets once you get up into the $250, $500 a year. And then we also have an option where you could join at whatever level you want and then make a renewable um, donation, which would automatically be um, paid for. And you would decide if that was yearly, monthly, weekly, um, every six months to whatever amount you want. So our membership numbers have not come back since before COVID. However, our membership dollars and personal donations have gone up, which we see as a trend. And one more quick follow-up. You also share the facility with Pantagino. Yes. How does, how does that arrangement work out? So Pantagino is a separate 501c3, and they rent our facility for um, their week of tech before they open. So that is, they bring in their sets, put everything together, run their light systems, check for sound, do dress rehearsals, and then they run three to four weeks of production and they pay rent. Um, it's a different rate per, for rehearsals versus um, performance. So rent each year from them is a very small amount for the amount of time that they're in our space. It's about six to seven thousand dollars. Terrific, thank you. Any more questions for the Milford Arts Council? I don't see any more. Thank you, Paige. Thank you all very much. Thank you for what you do for your organization. The next department on our agenda is Bridges, community health care. Jennifer Fiorello. Yes, hi, good evening. I'm Jennifer Fiorello representing Bridges Healthcare, uh, Chairman Vitro and honorable members of the Board of Aldermen. I'd like to express our gratitude for the city's continued support in helping us meet the behavioral health and substance use needs in the Milford community. Local funding and support is a vital safety net for our services as we experience deficits in our outpatient programs as a result of expenses exceeding what we generate in reimbursements and in our contracts. Without these funds, we run the risk of having to cut back on clinical staff, impacting the level of service that we're able to provide. 
In fiscal year 21-22, we served close to 2,000 Milford residents through our wide array of outpatient, psychiatric, medication management, and wraparound services. That is almost 60% of the total individuals we serve in the agency, in our catchment area. In addition to that number, our agency also touches more than 3,000 people through prevention efforts to target underage drinking and alcohol use through the Milford Prevention Council. Our agency has been committed to being responsive to the mental health crisis that continues to challenge our adults, youth, and families. Last fiscal year, we saw an overall 20% increase in the number of requests for service and a 40% increase for child services. Children are coming through our doors with higher levels of acuity, suicidality, aggression, and at one point, our waiting list to access our outpatient services for children for an evening appointment was four months. Bridges' dedicated staff work tirelessly to adequately treat many of these most challenging cases as we wait for broader changes to be made in our mental health system on a state level. It has been exhausting and taxing on our agency to keep up with the demand and maintain sustainability. As we finish out this fiscal year on June 30th, we are forecasting another increase in our expenses for next year as a result of inflation, like many other nonprofit agencies, including our utility costs and health insurance costs to the extent that any increase we might get in our contracts will be eaten up by that inflation tenfold. And as many know right now, adequate cost of living increases in our state contracts and for nonprofits is not looking too good based on the current budget, state budget that's been proposed. So now more than ever, uh, your, your support, your local funding is, is most vital for us and critical to our operations and ability to continue to meet the mental health needs in this community. Most of us know at least one person, maybe 10 people, um, who have been challenged by substance use and mental health issues. And our goal is that to continue to serve as many people as possible and be as accessible as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Jen, for that sure. presentation. Does anybody have any questions for the Bridges Community Healthcare? Alderman Vitale. Thank you, Mr. Chair, through you. <clears throat> Hi, Jen. Hi. Um, can you tell us what you anticipate as being the impactful impact on what the state has done with this, is it what was it one percent that they finally decided yeah, on? Yeah. So last fiscal year, we were very fortunate to get a large cost of living increase, and that allowed us to increase the wages for our clinical staff who were making below market. Um, we did that. We're still a little below market um, with clinical staff salaries, um, but the cost of inflation on top of the increased personnel cost from the increases in our staff salaries. Um, caused us to, um, at this point, with a 1% cost of living increase that's being proposed by the state, uh, the Appropriations Committee that um, just proposed the 1% cost of living, um, is going to be very impactful for us because the cost of inflation, as you know, is 5 to 6%, and it's just going to increase, you know, our utility costs and our health insurance costs are just going to continue to go up. Um, so th it will disallow us to increase salaries this year altogether. Can you give us some uh, idea on the impact of how many positions are not being filled and why aren't they being filled? Um, right now, we're down two full teams for intensive inpatient, uh, intensive um, in-home child and adolescent psychiatric service, which provides very intensive case management and clinical services to children who have um, serious behavioral issues. We're down two teams right now. And those two teams um, that were down are clinical staff, which just the intensity of this program is great. Um, and it completely um, reduces the number of, the amount of program services we generate in that program. So that program ends up operating at a steep deficit. Um, and we end up down clinical staff. We can't recruit them fast enough because that program, most clinicians don't want to be in that, work in that program because it's so intensive. When you talk a team, what, what constitutes a team? Uh, How many? A clinician and a case manager um, that go into the home together as a team to meet with the family um, many times a week. It's a very intensive program. Um, and those are the hardest positions, to, clinical positions to fill. We've had positions open for well over a year. Can you, can you also elaborate on the idea of what the difference between a social worker, 
uh, the, not the difference between a social worker, what they get paid, what, what you're able to pay a social worker at Bridges as opposed to what the state offers them and what is the impact of that situation? So private industry, um, other settings, state operated facilities pay their people at least 15 and 20 percent more. So we are, un I mean, we're unable to compete. We've, we do have um, incentive, not incentives, I can't say that, sign-on bonuses for clinicians now. Um, and that has been minimally effective in recruiting our staff. We just, um, happy to know that as of yesterday, I learned that our child outpatient services now is fully staffed with clinicians, um, which is good because we had a four month waiting list, so now that's down to about a month. But the demand is still, you know, there's still a consistent demand. Thank you. Thank you for all you do with the community and with the amount of resources that you have. Thank you. Thank you. Alderman German. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Jen, can you just explain again what your waiting list is for and how long? Um, so our waiting list depends on if they're adult for adults and children or children. So typically, when a child is referred to our agency, they go through a process called inquiry screening. Um, then they're they're handed off and they're scheduled an appointment based on the um, the urgency of the case, potential urgency of the case. So it's either routine urgent or emergent. The routine cases go with, into what's called an intake, a full clinical assessment within two weeks. Um, at that time, at the two week mark, um, they, they don't necessarily get treatment right then and there. So they have to go through a whole, we have to have an intake conference, a multidisciplinary team meeting with our psychiatrist and, and the clinicians to discuss the case and recommend treatment. And at that time, we recommend treatment. And then when we do that, it could be they could go into outpatient services. When they actually go into outpatient services, that's where the waiting list starts. So it could be eight weeks before somebody gets in. Or for right now, it's about four weeks for an evening appointment for children. Wow, thank you. Sure. Any more questions for Bridges Community Healthcare? I don't see any. Thank you, Jen. Thank you. Thank you for everything you do for the community. Thank you. Next department on our agenda is the Council on Aging. Leonora Rodriguez. Come on up. Mr. Chairman, it does not appear that uh, Leonor or anyone from uh, the Council on Aging are here. We'll reach out again, uh, and if there's any questions, we can make sure that there's an opportunity to answer those questions. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So we'll move on to the next department on our agenda, Beth L. Center. Jennifer Paradise. Good evening, Jennifer. I have handouts as well. You, you got something to hand out? I do. I didn't hear we, we always like things that are handed out. Good evening. Thank you so much for um, all that you do and um, just for this long night and all the long nights that you have had behind you and ahead of you. Um, it's, it's greatly appreciated. Um, I'm here tonight to just talk about what the past year has looked like for the center um, and answer any questions um, that you may have. Um, of course, we've heard tonight and pick up any newspaper or tune into any news channel. Um, we understand that Housing, homelessness, hunger are, um, are kind of top priority issues um, for, for us to be discussing. And so um, I'll go into it. Uh, you know, the center has really focused on building out this continuum um, that I've talked about in front of you um, for a, a few years now, um, providing more tools to the folks that we serve outside of just shelter and our soup kitchen services. Um, we believe the work that we do is, is on a continuum. Um, and although complex, the equation is, is kind of simple. Um, it's about reducing inflow and increasing outflow. Um, reducing inflow is about preventative services. Um, and so we have established um, a, pretty, a pretty substantial diversion program. That's our word for prevention. 
um, that supports households who are at imminent risk of homelessness and who have identifying um, characteristics of uh, a person who, um, or household um, who's at risk of, of homelessness. So that program has been online um, and has grown over the past year. Um, one of the handouts that you have is a pretty complicated workflow or kind of wonky looking workflow. That's the document that we're handing out to all of the other departments within the city um, that we work very closely with to ensure that we're all kind of on one accord around how do you assist somebody who is experiencing housing instability. Um, you'll notice um, colleagues um, from, from other departments on there. Um, and so it just speaks to how we coordinate together to ensure that folks are getting the services that they need. Um, also, if you have a constituent that reaches out to you, you know how to help them. Um, the next program that, that uh, I'd like to talk about that is um, a little bit older, just a, about a year older than our diversion program that's two years old, is our outreach and engagement program. So we do have case managers who are in the community working with individuals who are unhoused. Um, this is about um, getting folks uh, uh, to the next step, whatever that might be. Um, for some folks, that's a overnight or weekend conversation. For other folks, it takes years. Um, we are, we've seen the most success in a few uh, encampments in the community, um, and we don't have a, a lot, but, um, but we've been able to shrink the population in um, two of our encampments um, by 50%, um, which is really critical. Um, and we've had conversations with departments like Open Spaces um, to talk about how do we clear up um, uh, encampments former encampment spaces um, to make sure that uh, uh, the, the space can be restored back to its proper use. Um, in our diversion program, we've served 175 households um, over the past two years. Um, in 2022, our outreach and engagement program served 116 individuals. Um, that could mean that we served them from intake to housed or we assisted them with basic needs. Of course, we still operate our shelter program, um, a 34-bed um, facility um, that's year-round for men, women, veterans, and families. Um, last year, we served 132 individuals, including 90, 94 adults and 38 children. Um, we do have a family triage program that we um, have operated uh, uh, over several years, um, including through the pandemic. Um, and um, that is for literally homeless families, so unsheltered families. Um, we have had identified families um, who are uh, uh, unsheltered in, in the Milford community. Um, and so that program is really just getting them in, getting them connected as quickly as possible. Um, and it's nothing special. It's, it's cots in our soup kitchen dining hall. Um, and, um, and so that's just in addition to, to the shelter work that we do. Of course, we have our No Freeze. Um, this year it was a warming center program um, and supported 15 individuals overnight. Um, our average um, in that program was 17 individuals. So um, we really saw just the need be um, higher than, um, uh, than what the resources provided at the time, um, but we may do. Um, and then um, we have our permanent supportive housing program. Uh, so folks know um, uh, that we have our permanent supportive housing site at 85 Liberty Point. Um, if you didn't know that, now you do. Um, that is for a, a, a highly vulnerable, chronic, uh, chronically homeless individuals. Um, and um, provides uh, rental assistance plus case management to prevent recidivism, because that equation at the beginning reduce inflow, increase outflow, um, and, um, and it has a 100% success rate for us at Liberty Point. Um, permanent supportive housing is pretty powerful for folks who just need some stabilization and, and support. Um, we have expanded that program to do what we call site-based PSH, I'm sorry, scattered site PSH. Um, and so, um, so we've, we've grown that program by 100%, which feels like a lot, but we went from five units to 10 units. So we're still talking about small numbers there. We'd love to do more. Um, and um, lastly, but certainly not uh, least, I think um, our, our soup kitchen is um, just bustling. Um, you know, we were open every day during the pandemic, thanks to many of you all, this community. Um, and um, we saw, uh, we served 33,472 meals in, in 2022. Um, that's not our high. I think our high was in 2020 um, with 35,000 meals. Um, or so, or 2021, um, but, um, 
uh, but we haven't come back down from pre-pandemic numbers. We've been really seeing that, that plateau and um, expect to see that into the future. Um, I'll end where I started, just really talking about um, uh, the nature of our work right now. Um, you know, the, the, there, there are wait lists for our services, um, uh, much like our colleague at Bridges was, was sharing. And so we really do um, want to um, expedite as, as much as we can someone's experience and episode um, um, when, they're, when they're seeing us. Um, one of the struggles that we have is the low vacancy rates um, in the in the city, in the state, um, and just housing affordability in general. Um, how this relates to why I'm here in front of you tonight um, in, the, in the budget is we are asking for a nominal um, increase um, from last year. Um, uh, thankfully, um, the, the mayor's office as well as the Board of Finance supported that ask. Um, and that is really to just respond to um, the increased costs associated with every single case that we see. Um, we had an individual um, a couple months ago um, who uh, applied to over 50 housing units before he was accepted by one. Um, this is an individual who lives on social security disability. Um, so he is, in our world, deeply low income, even though he worked his entire life and is um, now of a non-working age. Um, and so that's really why we're asking for additional funds. It's that it does take um, more money to support each of the, each of the, the individuals and families that we see. Um, lastly, before, before taking questions, um, I realize that it, it has been a long time since many of you have been at the center, and so I was hoping to just throw a date out there to, to jot down in the calendar, and I can follow up um, uh, later on uh, with a formal request. But um, Friday, June 9th, um, at 2 p.m., we'd invite you all to have a walkthrough of the center and to see our facilities and to meet some of the staff um, that do this work every day. Um, and if that date totally doesn't work for you, we can certainly work out um, something else individually. But um, with that, I'm happy to take questions. Oh, and I should say, I'm here with Max tonight, um, our board president. So I don't know if you have anything to say. Uh, the only thing I'll say is about 40 years ago, I sat approximately where the mayor is sitting on the board of Alderman and uh, Alderman Beatty, no one could hear back then, <laughs> so some things haven't changed. It's on purpose. I, I, sh I should know, and um, I apologize, I, sh I should have done this at the beginning. Um, you know, the center is a staff of, of 24 individuals um, with um, over 120 volunteers a month. Um, and so, you know, those working hours are certainly not um, found in our operating budget, um, but 22 of those individuals are our board members um, that truly are um, the hardest working folks that, um, that I have the privilege to work with, and I mean that. Um, to navigate this world um, right now is um, uh, uh, just difficult, um, and so thank you. Thank you for being here tonight. Anyone have any questions for Bethel Center? Alderman German. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, through you, to Jen and, and Max. Good to see you both, and, and thank you for all the good work you do. A um, couple things. I know the uh, Rotary volunteers quite often in the kitchen and prepares foods. How do people get involved or if somebody else wants to volunteer, do they just contact you or are you looking for volunteers? We are always looking for volunteers. In fact, we had our volunteer, we have a monthly volunteer orientation. So it starts with an application. Um, application can be found on the website. Um, we had our monthly uh, orientation today and um, we've been, you know, one volunteer a month, two, maybe two new volunteers a month. Um, this month we had nine. And I was just so blown away by, by that presence. Um, and they ranged in ages, they ranged in purpose, um, and, um, and just really excited to see all of them um, come on board. I think um, it's gonna, hopefully it's a trend. Um, and um, 
because we certainly have work for them to do. So soup kitchen's probably the, what folks think about the most, um, but uh, support in our office, our administrative needs. Um, we are extremely direct service heavy, um, and so the administrative capacity that we have is minimal. Um, and then facilities. Um, we have a, um, a wonderful building that we've been in for um, over 30 years, right? Um, if my math uh, is, is right, just about. And, um, and, and we've done well in it, but it shows. Um, and so we have things breaking <laughs> that need repairing all the time. So facilities volunteers are definitely um, high on my priority list. <laughs> Now, quick follow-up on that. Were you guys looking to expand that building uh, at one point? Um, we, we are. Um, we, I don't know if it's, and I don't think it will be expanding our current building. Um, I think um, the plan is to find an alternate site that would allow us to right-size our operations. Um, if you, and, and I, I, I do hope folks take me up on the tour, um, if you were to walk through our building, what you'd see is um, the, a clear need for additional space. When we moved in um, several decades ago, we were those two core programs of shelter and soup kitchen. Um, and because we have four additional programs operating from that space right now, um, it is office share mania. Um, that brings up concerns around confidentiality and HIPAA and all, and all those needs. Um, we also have um, just the awkwardness of working where people live um, because of just the way that this, the center was set up. Um, but it's also um, uh, uh, just this so there's, there's logistical needs that need to be responded to in the near future. Um, all of that in addition to all of our systems being end of life. So um, the building was retrofitted, um, you know, we're several decades later. We replaced our water heaters um, two weeks ago. Um, you know, so those things, those big ticket items are going. Um, but if you look at, um, and there, there are definite models that reflect this across the country very successfully, if you look at the way in which um, we're building our operations to respond, again, getting back to that uh, reduce inflow and increase outflow, um, there's a um, pretty specific methodology to the way a building can be set up um, that allows for there to be a 24-hour access, like open door. Um, so you think about our No Freeze program, how wonderful is that every night anywhere, anyone in the city of Milford who's unsheltered can have somewhere to go. That program closed March 31st because of funding. Um, so we want to include in our space 24 hour, 24 hour access for an individual year round. Um, and then just being able to have like really sensible things like um, uh, um, we call it micro shelter. But so it's basically if you were to sleep in our, our um, uh, shelter programs as individuals, um, you'd be in a dorm setting. Um, if you're an individual male, you'd be in a room um, that's much smaller than this um, with 12 other men. Um, and um, just with, um, with the pandemic and with everything we know about trauma-informed care, um, that is not the way in which we should be um, uh, moving forward in our, in our work. So um, that does require us to have more space, um, not because the intent is to serve a larger population, um, it's really just to create more holistic, a space with more holistic um, uh, uh, services and wraparound care um, and be able to serve the, the people that we serve now a, just a, a little bit better, a little bit differently. And, and just one more follow-up, Mr. Chairman. Um, can you, you have a big gala coming up. Can you just explain and uh, share with us and maybe get a lot of these folks to go? <laughs> we do. Um, so, you know, we, we fundraise for a large majority of our budget. Um, you know, the, the, again, just reflecting on what Jen um, shared um, about the state budget, um, you know, homeless services, and this is, this is pretty wonky, but um, much of the, the funds that we receive from the state of Connecticut is actually passed through dollars from the federal government. So the COLA increases that were given to nonprofits over the past two years only applied to the state funding that is allocated to, um, that, is, that is in our contracts. So while COLA increases were 6% or 8% or whatever over year over year, um, ours was less than 1%. 
Um, and so I say that because I think it's important for people to understand that, um, and that just means that we fundraise more. Um, and so the gala, we try to make it as painless as possible. Um, so the gala is a, uh, on June 17th um, at Grassy Hill. It'll be a great night. Um, it's 60s theme, so we, that's what I mean about painless. We try to make it fun, um, so it'll be, you know, uh, hopefully a good time. Thanks for bringing that up. Alderman Parente. Thank you, Chairman Through you. Good evening. Uh, I first wanted to just thank you for treating our, our community members who experience homeless with dignity and respect that they deserve. <clears throat> you really lead by example, and um, that's really important in our community. Thank you. Uh, and kind of following uh, this issue around the country and our nation, uh, it doesn't seem that it will be too long before Connecticut <clears throat> is really faced with what we're seeing in other parts of the country out on the West Coast. And as we're preparing in our community, infrastructure-wise, for that, could you give us feedback about what you anticipate in terms of needs for our population here? Uh, and also, tying that to um, ARPA monies, I know that the first original ARPA plan had a little grant money for small businesses and for nonprofits. I don't see that in the updated plan. If there was an allocation of money that would be available what would be helpful to you in terms of serving our community now, anticipating where we're going to go, <clears throat> and again, really continuing to treat um, our community members who don't have uh, the privileges we have in, in the correct way. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I think that there is a lot of fear out there um, when it comes to the scenes that we see from the West Coast. Um, and other places um, th throughout the country. Um, and um, I, I kind of want to respond to that first by say, those are preventative, those are preventable circumstances. Now it takes an enormous amount of coordination to prevent them. Um, but what we see in those other communities across the country is really not a lack of um, uh, of homeless services or, or policy response, it's the um, kind of system outside of the crisis response. So um, really what it comes down to um, is uh, affordable housing. Um, homelessness is an affordable housing issue. Um, the, over the past two years, Connecticut, so we've spent over the past decade driving down the numbers of homelessness and we've got to come before you and say we decreased homelessness by X percent and that feels good. Um, it took us eight years to decrease homelessness by 40 percent in the state of Connecticut. It took us two years um, to, to lose all of that. Um, uh, now COVID certainly, um, the housing crisis um, certainly and the economic um, issues that, that came with all of it. Um, Played, played a factor. And why we don't see the immense um, unsheltered homelessness, of, though of course we've seen some of those circumstances, is because of how our shelter system is structured, because what our systems look like, because of that efficiency that we talked about. Um, but there are pockets of the state, um, particularly if um, folks are familiar, we're working on a, um, our colleagues in New Haven um, at Union Station. Um, where there is an encampment that has essentially established itself within the Union Station um, in, in New Haven. Um, and so we are starting to see some, some, some of in, that, those types of situations. Um, I say it's preventable because when you get local communities together to talk about what the needs are and you make some decisions about what you want to do for your local community, you can relieve some of that pressure. Um, and so I, I know that that's um, uh, you know, in the vision planning of this city because of the affordable housing plan that you put out. Um, I, I'll say one quick thing because I know that you all have a, a, a long night. Um, you know, I, I talk about homelessness as being an affordable housing issue because um, the, the way in which housing works, because <laughs> we all, um, you know, um, uh, uh, have some exposure to this um, is that you you pay to play you pay to rent you pay to own um, and the conditions of the market right now are such um, that it's driving costs 
way up, whether for vacancy, um, uh, the people who are, um, I think of college graduates, they can't buy their first home, they're in the rental market, and they're driving up the cost of the rental market, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so the folks that become, that can't compete, that become excluded from the housing market are the most vulnerable individuals in our society. So they're seniors, they're people who are disabled, they're children, um, and so that becomes the population of people that we see at the center. Um, I, I, I like to back into that a little bit because I think the stigma is still associated with, like, these are folks that, you know, they could have made better decisions and they didn't, so they're here now, and so we should help them because, you know, God said so. <laughs> um, but, um, but, but no, there's actual, you know, there's evidence as to why this happens. Um, so that's, that's the first question, is that it is um, a, a, a solvable thing, takes a lot of coordination. Um, second question, I forgot. I'm so sorry. You had a follow-up that was... Oh, ARPA dollars. Yes, yes I'm so sorry. Um, you know, yeah, I mean, I think that it, we're seeing a really interesting situation right now in that there are communities that are far along on their ARPA spending and then there are communities that are somewhat behind. Um, we have this increasing homeless issue, and so I would put those dollars right to the front of our system to reduce the wait times for people accessing the system um, and really focus on um, building relationships with landlords to, that are long-term. Um, so it would be service dollars, um, quite frankly. I mean, we have a system that works. We do, we know it. We've, we've done this with veterans, we've done this with chronic homelessness over the years. It's just about resourcing it appropriately. Alderman Vitale. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for you. Hi, Jen, hi, Max. Um, thank you for, obviously, for the work you do in the community. But my question is this, and I don't know if there was a second handout. We only got one piece of paper. I don't know, maybe there wasn't. Oh. Um, the capacity of the, the capacity of the shelter, did you say 17? I don't know why I did. No, and I'm sorry, there were three handouts. Um, three did, handouts? Yeah, oh, I did not make one. them into a packet, so it's my fault. If okay. I can email it out. No to problem. Sure what is the so capacity? Our year-round shelter program is a capacity, of, we have 34 beds, okay. so it's 12 men, 5 women, okay. 6 families. It, what areas, at this point, your sense is, what areas, geographical areas, do they represent? Um, so 65, uh, just over 65% are from the greater Milford area. So we consider that to be Milford, Orange, and Woodbridge. Um, the next kind of large um, grouping is from Ansonia, Seymour, Derby, Shelton. Um, and then, you know, kind of the, the balance of that is New Haven. And, and Having said that, do you approach any other municipalities for funding? Um, we don't go to other uh, municipal governments for funding. Um, I, I hope that that's in our very near future. Um, the, the diversion program that we offer actually covers um, from Milford to Guilford and the Greater Valley area. Um, that was a part of, a part of the, 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 the deal when we took on that contract and we knew that we were skilled to be able to do it because we were already doing it in Milford. Um, but we serve those communities in other ways through our emergency shelter program um, in small percentages, but some and in, in our soup kitchen program. Um, so I think that that needs to be a part of our future strategy around um, balancing our budget. Yeah, do the other municipalities even know that you service them? Ab yes, yes, they do. Absolutely, yeah, and, we're in conversation. And there's been no voluntary, obviously, no voluntary financial aid. No, there's not. To that point. But you do plan on getting to these municipalities because that would be a good idea. I think it's necessary, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Any more questions for Bethel Center? Alderman Parente. Thank you, through you, Chairman. Can you tell us a little bit more about the, um, the program, the No Freeze program? Yeah. And what you anticipate this year, what can we do to help support the program? Yeah, I mean, um, this would have to be something that I think we sh that, that we'd come together on and talk about. Um, the, the funding for cold weather services um, uh, 
last this past season and the season before were both through the state budget um, and uh, it's a part of the recommended uh, uh, state budget um, recently passed by appropriations to cut that funding statewide so that would bring our um, our, uh, our budget um, close to zero um, on operating um, so that that uh, program costs us about $50,000 to run annually, um, or this past year, I should say, um, and that was um, in our soup kitchen, right? So um, it was a building that we already pay operating costs for. Um, so slight increases to utilities, a lot of it goes into staffing um, and additional support when necessary, security, um, things like that when, when necessary. Um, and that's really, uh, we bring on that, that contract um, to really just be good stewards to our neighbors um, that are on the, on the site with us and, and the security um, do, during peak times um, helps our neighbors feel safer. But yeah, so I mean, to your point, it is something that every community is going to have to decide how they want to operate it um, in the season to come if the budget, if the state budget stays um, where it is now. Any more questions for Beth Elson? I don't see any. Thank you all. Thank you, Jennifer. See you, Max. The next department on our agenda is the city clerk's office. Karen Fortunati. <coughs> Good evening, Karen. Good evening. Uh, I'll make this quick. Things are very good in the city clerk's office, and that is thanks to Mayor Blake, the Board of Finance, and this board. You supported my request for a new records management software, and it was um, to replace a program that the office had for about 15 to 20 years. So the program has exceeded my expectations. The efficiencies, the ease of use, it's been, it's been a joy to work with and a game changer. So thank you very much for that. Um, I also wanted to let you know that it was a timely change because we transitioned in May of last year, 2022, and our former vendor suffered a basically catastrophic cyber attack in December, which hit, um, they operated in several states. There's probably 40 to 60 clerk's offices in Connecticut that have it, shutting down access to the online land records. So we really, we lucked out. So. Uh, Thank you again, it was really fortuitous that we changed when we did. So um, if you have any questions for me, I'm happy to answer them, but, but things are well, so thank you. Any questions for the city clerk's office? Alderman Gurman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, through you. Um, thank you for all the good work you did, and that's good timing, I guess, so terrific. Are all these positions filled in your office at this point? So within the last three weeks, I lost uh, one of my assistant clerks who retired for family reasons. And then another assistant clerk is going to be leaving next week uh, to join another clerk's office in Stratford. Any more questions for the city clerk's office? I don't see any, Karen. I think you're off the hook. So I'm going to stay up here. We're doing a lot yes. of next, so. Yes, you can stay right there. Thank you. <clears throat> the next department on the agenda is the Register of, of Voters. Deborah Fallenbaum and Kelly Rowland. Kelly Rowland. members of the board, uh, 
Um, Deborah and Karen and I work very closely together on all aspects of elections and voting, and although I'm speaking, um, it's not without all of, the, all of the great collaboration that we do. So I just happen to be the one in the middle because I was the last to the table, I guess. Uh, so I handed out, or we handed out tonight, uh, some information on early voting. That's the big uh, thing hitting elections in the state of Connecticut as the legislature decides what early voting is going to look like. And while we were sitting in the back, modern technology and collaboration within the city, thanks to Steve Johnson, uh, forwarded me and Deborah a text saying that WTNH is now reporting that even if the legislature passes early voting, uh, Secretary Thomas has decided there isn't enough time to implement it in this November election, which we should all be jumping up and down for joy <laughs> because we did not have the money in the budget to pay for that. And that's, so we won't belabor what you have in front of you. I ask you to put it in your budget packet for next year because um, it is coming and it is expensive uh, because 10 or 14 days of early voting before a general election will, will take quite a bit of staffing. Um, but we don't have to belabor it tonight, luckily. Uh, that's a very good thing. Um, but I will pick up from last year's uh, discussion about tabulators. As we all told you, the stories with the tabulators, they are really, really, really near the end of their life cycle. Uh, I know that in a conversation I had with our state senator, James Maroney, uh, bonding has gone forward out of uh, the committee for uh, new tabulators in 2024. So hopefully the legislature will pass that so that we won't feel the impact at the local level, that that's something that they will be purchasing for all of the communities throughout Connecticut. Um, however, if early voting were to take place in April uh, of 2024 for the presidential preference primary, uh, and we don't have those tabulators yet, we do have some expense that we are going to need to work with our finance director on how to pay for that. So there is, there is a slight chance, uh, depending on how these things roll out from the state level, that we will be impacted in the municipality. But I can assure you, like we always do, we'll come up with the most creative, cost-effective way to deal with those issues. Um, on a very positive note, uh, we would like to invite you all, and you'll be getting an email shortly, to our poll worker appreciation event that uh, the Secretary of the State has offered to provide to all the municipalities. Um, we're, we're looking at a date of May 31st for that event, so please mark your calendar for us because we'd love to have you come and celebrate all of the poll workers, um, past and present, uh, who got us through COVID and who have been um, poll workers for 10, 15, or more than 20 years. So they'll be quite a, a, an enjoyable recognition, recognition ceremony taking place on May 31st. Right here. Right here right in here. City Hall. 12 o'clock noon. But again, the email will be forthcoming. Um, and, and basically, that's all I have. Since we don't have to talk too specific, the details that I provide, or we provided um, in your handout will show you what we estimate costs to be going forward for early voting. But other than that, unless we have anything to add, we won't keep you unless you have questions for us. Anyone have any questions for the Registrar of Voters? Alderman Gurman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Through you to Carrie and Deborah. So what is the overall <laughs> estimated cost for early voting? Do we have like a general? So if you flip the handout over, Deborah made me clean up my handwritten notes uh, and type them up for you so they were clear. Uh, but that is a, a very conservative estimate. 1.8 to 2.8, 2.3 million? Uh, that's not, that, you're looking at a Board of Ed handout. Registrar of voters on the back page. It's about $35,000. Looks like this, and so if you look at if you look at the bottom uh, estimating staffing cost, given 88 total hours, with an estimated 26 people covering those hours, and simply at minimum wage, we're talking about 34,000 dollars. 
for the 10 day period. If it's 14 days, obviously it's more and that's sort of estimated out on the other side. Just to give you an idea of what we're looking at in terms of hours. Keep in mind that our office runs uh, nine to one normally. So in the bottom right hand corner, um, there will be some additional cost because our office runs on a four hour a day schedule and will be required to be running eight, eight hours for eight of those days and uh, 12 hours for two days. Any more questions for the Register of Orders? I don't see any. The next department on our agenda is... Technically, it's us, our department oh, part. Elections with Karen Fortunati and Deborah Baumbaum and Carrie Rowland. I think we just did that, but, did but technically now, Registrar of Voters does have a very small department department budget if you'd like to ask us any questions about that. Do you have any? Does anybody have any questions for that department? I think you're done. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Have a wonderful night. Next department on our agenda is the Law Department, Mr. John Bertram. Morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good evening. Sorry, it's almost morning. Present. Um, so the uh, my budget is flat, other than the uh, contractually approved uh, increases. Um, I really don't have anything to say other than I'm happy to answer your questions uh, this evening. Anyone have any questions for the law department? I don't see any law department questions. Mr. Bertram. Question, Mr. Uh, Chair. Alderman Vitale. Mr. Chair, through you. Good evening, Mr. Uh, Bertram. Um, do we have a risk manager at this point? Um, so, Chair, through you to Alderman Vitale, we do. She is two people to your right. So, that begs the question. There's there's paralegal. Seven, there's seven positions. Uh, Tony Weeks became the full-time risk manager, as you know from years oh. past. She had been in acting capacity. She has ascended to full-time risk manager. The paralegal position is open, so we have seven positions in the department. Six um, are currently filled. Uh, the, the paralegal position is open, but the paralegal is open. It's, yeah, for the last. Two months, six weeks, uh, but we're, we're making do. There's, there's two part-time lawyers, myself and, and uh, Matthew Woods, trial counsel. Deborah Kelly is a full-time attorney. Two administrative assistants, and Tony's our risk manager. Thank you. And just to give you a frame of reference in terms of growth, um, I had a 10-year look back terms of where we are and obviously with a department my size you can tell it's it's pretty small um, relative to the departments that all of you have been asked to review uh, in 2000 10 years ago the department total was six hundred and seven thousand two hundred sixty one dollars as you note, the proposed budget before you is seven hundred two thousand nine hundred twenty six so ten years an increase of ninety five thousand dollars over ten years Cost inflation, things that you know, cost CPI. I think that's pretty good. It's a pretty, pretty flat. You know, Nine thousand dollars over ten years. Uh, so, you work hard. There's a lot of great people. Any questions for the law department? I don't see any, Mr. Bertram. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for staying up with us. <laughs> the, the next department on our agenda is Public Works. Mr. Chair, before we get <laughs> Director Saley, can we have a recess? Sure. Thank you. Five-minute recess.
Keep on guessing.
Chris Sealy got to go home, you know. <laughs> I didn't have lunch, or I'm sure I didn't have dinner yet. And I'm, I, I missed, didn't plan this well. Let's put it that way. I wanted to impress you. So good evening, everybody. I appreciate the time uh, letting Steve Johnson and myself speak about public works and, and our demands and challenges that we have in the department. I know it's been a long night, um, so you guys know it's long, long enough and well enough, so I don't have to get into a long spiel about where we are. Um, just open it up to questions and see what everyone has, uh, what we can answer or not. Alderman Gurman. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Through you to uh, Director Saley and uh, Mr. Johnson. Um, let's start off with how many positions are not filled, please. So presently, we have 23 positions that have, are not filled. Um, over the last five years, I would say we averaged between 22 to 25 positions that have been vacant for that time frame. I see we have eight divisions for the Public Works Department, so I'm going to open up if you want any questions regarding any one of those eight departments, you go right ahead and ask, just tell us what department you're asking the question about, okay? They'd make this uh, a little bit more uh, efficient. Alderman Beatty. Thank you. Through you. Chairman Dietro, and we're all tired and we all want to go home, so the, the idea is to keep it efficient. But I am going to make a couple of remarks because we are being recorded and the public is listening. MGAP, maybe we're a hit tonight. And um, I think that we want to say, and I'll say it for you, that um, public works plays a critical role in public safety via oversight for wastewater treatment management, sewers, plowing, paving of roads, traffic mitigation, structure installation, trash collection, bulk pickup and building maintenance. And they're across eight divisions. So I'm saying that. So if there is ever any lingering thought that public works are just trash collection. And we have, it's key to the administration's vision of a beautiful city. Street paving, pothole repair, line painting, and storm cleanup are important elements that add beauty services and efficiency to the administration's efforts. In addition, you're not a cost. Uh, you are an important investment for the city. Milford is able to apply for and has accepted grants from the Federal Emergency Management Association, FEMA, and at the federal level from the Department of Energy and Environmental Services, deep at the state level, and from other grant sources. You can't accept the grant unless you have the facility and the people and the expertise to execute them. So in that way, uh, you're. And then lastly, um, we. Uh, this is from a report that I developed as chair of the committee as early as 222 in early spring before the May, before the April budgeting of that year. So all of this is on record. And we wanted to make it clear that we thought it was an issue of reaching capacity rather than a matter of asking for additional funding. But at that time, there was lots of talk. Do you have eight vacant positions? Do you have 15? Do you have 20? Maybe the director is exaggerating. I have a report from Tanya Bonds from HR, which is the vacancy report. And as far as I can tell, there are about 21 vacant positions. She also has a record of when emails were sent to administration. Is this going to be filled soon? Can I release this? This is reported. And she has a track record. So it's meant to be a thoughtful and informative, uh, not a blame. But those positions have been vacant. They're on the verge of affecting public safety. And we want the residents to hear. So thank you. Mr. Chairperson. Now you can get your eight divisions. Any more questions for Public Works? 
Alderman Ginatazio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Through you, good evening, Director Saley. I wanted to um, speak to you or ask you about solid waste. I know that I'm on the Public Works Committee as well, and we talk about projects and things like that, but I would like to get an update on that. I know that these uh, dump fees have been increasing quite a bit. I know that we're even paying to dispose of our recyclables. And where, what is your projection moving forward with the solid waste uh, section of your department? I appreciate the question. Um, most people in the state, I don't think, grasp the, the, the issue that we have within the state in regards to solid waste and recycling. Um, recently, uh, our vendor that we use up in Shelton had a major fire where there was a, a significant, significant amount of damage done at the building. So there's not a lot of redundancies with, with recycling and trash, and the same thing with the burn plant in Bridgeport. The state is really in a pickle. Um, we're, we're shipping out, when I say we, the, the, the state as a whole, shipping out a significant amount of the solid waste that's produced. Uh, when I first started, I think our, our trash was somewhere about $56 a ton. Uh, presently, it's 68 and change. Uh, that's over a, a nine-year period. And our contract that was a 10-year contract. Those were just cost of living increases that it incurred that. The, the, the contract is expiring as of next July 1st. And we're already anticipating a significant increase of our present value. Along with that, as everyone's been well aware, the recycling component, we used to, a number of years ago, get $20 a ton. Right now, we're paying 98 and 98.53 a ton to get rid of our recycling. It's a significant cost to the department. One of the things that we've done to eliminate some of these costs is we took over the transfer station a number of years ago internally. Uh, it saved the city a significant amount of money, but right now, because of the annual cost increases, we're anticipating somewhere between a four hundred fifty and a five hundred fifty thousand dollar deficit in solid waste. The other thing that a lot of people don't realize, and, and people bring it up, that we don't just do one thing. We're, the department does many, many things, and we are the last resort in a lot of areas. And I, I can name a few of them. When the children's library was redone a number of years ago, there was some missing. Uh, information in regards to the, the architectural design and, and building maintenance uh, went in there and, and, and assisted to get that project off the ground and that's just one of many I mean this past year we, we have the Taylor building which everyone should be aware of there was major work done the chamber was in there for a number of years um, uh, Pat Devine along with Larry La who was one of our foremans for uh, building maintenance went in and assisted and renovated the building I'm not sure if everyone's had a chance to see it but these are the little things that no one sees. The usage in the city is tremendous. I, I mean, it really is. There's a lot going on every single weekend, especially from Memorial Day to Labor Day. Uh, the beaches sometimes need to be trash picked up two times a day. Uh, bathrooms, we have someone on staff continually. This was all done without any increase in labor costs by being more efficient. It was interesting, I sat and listened to some of the meetings that were pro previously this meeting uh, from home. And I know a lot of people spoke about, you know, doing less with more. And I can say that this department has done less with more. And it's been doing it for many, many years. And as some of the other departments said, we are at a tipping point. We have to make a decision if we're going to continue to expand services, which this department has done across the board since I've been and Steve's been involved, we need more assistance. Just to follow up, uh, Mr. Chairman, through you. So, Director Saley, this contract for the solid waste is going to expire when? June, June 30th, 2023. I'm sorry, 2024. Okay. So we have another approximately a year and a few months under the existing contract. We'll have a cost of living. I think it starts in, in, in uh, July. Uh, I'm sorry, April or, or? Yeah, I think April. April, uh, the annual cost of living because that's when the contract was signed. This past year, it was a five and a half increase, five and a half percent increase. An example, our, our, our waste disposal costs have been pretty consistent. And even if you just did that five and a half, it would have been $125,000 more this year than last year. Uh, that's just on that one item. We're not talking about recycling that's gone up significantly. Just to follow up, Mr. Chairman, what is the estimate of what is one bulk pickup cost the city if we were to eliminate one and i'm not 
offering that, but I'm just trying to understand. I know we have several. What would we save? So there's two bulk pickups, and since you bring it up, I would like to respond. I know politically it's a hot button item. I would like to see it be eliminated completely. Uh, and I'll tell you a number of reasons, number why people throw out a lot of things that could be reused, recycled. Instead, people just have the ease of just throwing it out to the curb. Uh, it's, a, it's a high demand, not only on our equipment, but on our staff. Uh, and, and it's a very challenging time. Uh, but recycling, predominantly, we do about 1,800 tons uh, in, the, in the spring pickup. And in the fall, we do anywhere between eight to 1,000 tons. So it's a smaller amount in, in, in the fall. So th those dollar amounts equate to about $400,000 a year combined. And that would cover your deficit with the increase in the dump fees? I mean, if you were to eliminate them, to your point, entirely? It would be close, but I don't think it would eliminate it you know, entirely. Okay. You have to understand that that number has stayed pretty consistent since I've been here, the disposal fee cost. And an example, a lot of times people don't understand when we have other issues, it's not just the trash. An example, when we have a storm at some of the beach communities and we have to sweep up the street sweepings, they, they have to be disposed of. So they'll go to city carting on Old Gate Lane. You know, when I first started, it was under $80 a ton. Now it's $130 a ton to get rid of material like that. There was one event that we had, to, we literally had to get rid of sand because it's contaminated. It costs us almost $20,000. And that's what a lot of people don't see. I know, it's, it's hard to make up those um, increases. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. With a new contract. Okay, yeah. So, w what are we gonna do with all the money we saved on snow removal this year? <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, an example, I, I think a lot of people, the, the board should know that a lot of the money that we use is done through town aid. Town aid is a funding component through the state. They give it as for road work, sidewalk work, snow removal, uh, salt. Uh, so that money that we didn't use for snow removal, we actually put into equipment for the, the highway division. And I have a broken down list. I'm more than happy to show with you. It was over $250,000. That's another example of, of a, an account that's been underfunded, which is our garage um, equipment account. It's a very challenging time. Uh, we have older equipment. Uh, we've been blessed that we've been able to buy new equipment, but an example, our street sweepers, high use, high demand, a lot of repairs. Our trash components, same thing. Our trash automated components let us eliminate two positions through attrition, but those, those automated trucks are high use trucks. You know, we pick up between 700 and 1,000 cans a day, a lot of wear and tear. The private industry, and I would explain this to the board previously, has usually replaces their trucks every five years, five to six years. That's the private industry. We have trucks now that we started in 2016, we're 2023. The lead time to buy these vehicles are almost two years. So we have to be more proactive instead of reactive to some of the issues that we see. Alderman Mulrennan. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, so you were talking about eliminating in your idea of the bulk pickup. So I know some communities that don't have bulk pickup, they have the residents then request and then they pay a fee. So is that something you would consider as if you were to eliminate that as an option or are you just like opposed to it altogether? And in that way, if you did charge it somewhat of a revenue base. So to answer that question, uh, it's not my decision if we get rid of bulk or not. It's really the boards. Uh, the recommendation would be maybe a hybrid like you're suggesting. Uh, I think the idea that everything's for free should be eliminated. That You're right, people should pay. There are people that use a ton of the bulking component, and there's other people that don't use it at all. So I think that would be a good alternative, and we could look at that. But I think it's something that we should discuss. This Alderman Beatty. Through you, Chairperson Vitro, thank you. I want to go back to the uh, positions again. In uh, 222, there was some disagreement, if you will, I was trying to get at so we could bring it to the board, about the number of positions. And, the, and you told me this year, after Labor Day, 
don't worry, it's, it's fixed. We're no longer, there were some loggerhead jams, which may happen between administration and the uh, directors. And you figure that out, and the positions would be forthcoming. I didn't know until we started the budget that all those hadn't been filled. Does this new hold, was that meant to undo that agreement? Tell us what's going on so we can see. I mean, were those, I, I understand there were eight positions after Labor Day that were finally put through and released, right? That had been on hold for a year. That's eight from 23, but those eight. Now, were they not filled? Only three trash people were, were hired? What happened? And it is now this new, a reiteration of that hold and a double down. What is it? So I would say that we, and I think at my meeting a year ago in May, I said I was going to be more forceful to try to get positions filled. It's no secret that I don't agree with some of the positions the administration has on this. Uh, I think the mayor should answer the question because for me, I want to fill the positions, not every single one of them, but I would like to give the mayor the opportunity to answer that question. Why they haven't been filled. But the, I just meant those original eight, so we're not talking about out of the 23. We, but, we but ne the, we, we've never really filled the positions because usually when someone retires, if we fill one position, we have another person retire. Right now we have a, a custodian that's out. We have buildings that aren't really supervised um, full time like we once had. I mean, these are the cuts that have happened. It, we're not, we can't make something out of here. So it, it's, it's a challenging time within the department. I didn't really want to ask the mayor because if we didn't want it to be a dialogue from the mayor. We have had, uh, we invited the mayor to the public works meeting. We've been trying to figure this out for a long time. There is a disagreement. We don't want to get involved in a, in, in, in a management versus a unit uh, authorship. But mm -hmm. I understood that those eight positions were filled and that there was some agreement about the ordinance which got in the middle of that and everything. All right, lastly, when we were talking just as a serendipitous moment to Scott Ellington in Animal Control tonight about the HVAC for his dogs, he mentioned that Public Works was doing a project there and Pat Devine was the manager. Is that an example of how uh, they've been stretched to do projects around the city? I thought, oh, ha ha, that Public Works is, yeah. has that on the list? So the, the, the unit that you're questioning was replaced. It's again where it's a partnership between us, when I say us, public works, and, and private, private contractors. Replacing a, a unit is really kind of out of our scope, a HVAC unit. Uh, it was a unit that was damaged and not in the best of water. Uh, to be honest, the, 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 the dog kennel is in need. We've done a lot of work down there, um, but it, it really should be looked at as a long-term plan to try to put a new one in that location. Uh, it's not FEMA compliant. It's definitely in a situation that if we had a major flood, we could have issues down there. Um, so those are the things that I think when I talk about long-term plans and looking at stuff, yes, that's what we'd like to do, be more proactive instead of reaction, reactionary, but also looking at it and saying, like, we work with not just them, I mean, the police department. We just did a major renovation. Pat Devine ran the project, but uh, we had members of our staff, both our electrician, uh, and, and our masons and our general laborers there at an extended amount of time. Uh, and I don't know if everyone's had the opportunity to look at the locker rooms in the, in the PD, but that was completed. Uh, it's a beautiful project. So these are the things that most people don't see, and it is. It's a, it's a major uh, challenge because the day-to-day -day operations in the city are really what we're supposed to be doing. These are major projects. We're excited to do them, but they're definitely challenging. Alderman Willis. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Through you to uh, Chris, hi, and hi, Steve. Um, going back to the uh, bulk pickup, how would that work administratively? Would they would be charged on their tax bill, and like there must be cost to that too to do to do something like that. I don't know how would that work, you know. So we're on a serve list uh, in the state. It's pretty much, it's a lot of different departments. So public, work, public Works is one of them. And different towns do it differently. A lot of times they're required to come down and purchase a ticket from our office for a dumpster, just say, or for a certain amount of you know, usage. Uh, so it would really be something we'd have to look at and figure out how it would be charged. I mean, we'd put a system in place that would make it work. 
Okay, so because I was wondering if somebody would be swamped with extra work, that would be another thing where you'd need need somebody else to, you know, I don't know what that entails, but. There are, uh, most of them are smaller towns, but they'll bring a three or four yard dumpster and leave it at someone's yard, and they'll get charged that, that component. But there's a lot of different ways to do it. Mr. Mr. Chairman, th through you, I did assure this board that as part of my transition, I would make sure that there was a smooth and seamless transition, or at least as smooth and seamless transition as possible. Uh, some advice that I can uh, impart to this board is that there is no uh, program in the city of Milford more popular, more wildly popular than our bulk trash pickup program. Just something for this board to consider in the years to come. The program as it's pres presently run. Alsben Marlowe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you. Hi, Chris. Um, Chris, a couple different questions here. Um, I know that the Public Works does a lot of work themselves, right? You were just mentioning the police station. Do you have any sense of, on average, how much you are saving the city by doing that, doing it that way instead of subbing it out? I mean, I, I could probably give you a percentage, an example. Right now, if you go out to bid with a project and a general contractor is running a job, typically they have anywhere between 15 and 25% 25, 25 profit and overhead on top of the job. So a general contractor will bring in subs and do the work, and then they'll put their 15 or 25%. So you can almost guarantee that's the number right there. But the, the Lisbon Landing Pavilion that we did, and I'm not talking about the concrete work, I'm just talking about the pavilion itself, I believe it was about 185,000 was the total dollar amount. That was with us. Mark Demchek was the electrician uh, that did a tremendous amount of work down there. That's an enterprise zone at Lisbon Landing. Um, but Pat Devine, and, and along with Tom Hunt, and, and our crew did a lot of what I call the, the nonsense work, clearing the lot, removing debris, the stuff that made it so that when the framer came in, he could take care of it and, and do the work. So we subbed it out. We were the general contractor. The reason I bring this up is we have another project, similar in scope but significantly smaller, that went out to bid, and it was over $400,000 for that work. So I would say the way we do it um, saves probably 50% value on it. So if it's, you know, if it's a $500,000 job, we're going to probably do it for two fifty. There was a project similar with the, with, uh, the, the police station, um, and I don't have the exact dollar amounts, I apologize. Uh, but uh, there was a police station that had uh, locker rooms renovated, and it was in excess of $950,000. And I, I, I don't know, has anyone seen the police station locker rooms? You really should take the chance and talk to Chief Mello and see them, because it really is a beautiful, beautiful. I mean, it took a while, I'm not going to lie, we're not the fastest. But um, it, it's really something to see. A lot of our, our, our guys took a lot of uh, passion in doing it. Um, Matt Davidson's our mason did a tremendous job with really fine brickwork and repointing things. Um, so I, I would say easily 50% would be the number I would use on the dollar amount. Thank you. Just a different question now is, um, with more sewer usage than anything else, with, with the uptick, I'll say that, in uh, units going in in Milford, you know, apartments, uh, a lot of development going on with these larger apartment buildings. Do you see that we're going to be in a position where the system can handle it, or are we going to be looking to build new pump stations or repair or whatever might happen? So it's a, it's a great question. Thank you. One of the things we're looking at, and we had our sewer commission meeting last night, it was, it was a productive meeting. We had some issues that we were addressing, and one of them was that the Housatonic plant, according to DEEP, has uh, an over amount of liquid coming in. So we're, we're looking at, number one, putting a, a, a study in place to figure out where the areas that we have I and I. It just means water getting in, clean water getting into our, our sanitary system. Um, we know some parts, uh, on, on not North Milford where there's no sewers, but on the other side of, of the Boston Post Road, um, there's some areas, but we're going to do that study. We're going to be a, a little bit more aggressive. We haven't done a lot of pipelining. 
the, the good news is pipelining is probably the most cost-effective way to restore pipes uh, in their present condition without doing digging. Uh, we have approximately $5 million, I think it is, in our reserve account, our emergency reserve account uh, with wastewater. That's a whole different fund, so everyone knows it's really, it's under our umbrella, but it's their own little world. That's where you pay your yearly fee. So I think we have an opportunity to be, you know, be proactive to a lot of these things, and hopefully we're going to reduce the amount of I and I coming into the system, and we're going to get ahead of it. But you are correct, there, are, there is some concern with the amount of units that they're talking about being built and that are being proposed. Thank you. Any more questions for Public Works? Alderman Ginotazio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, through you. Um, Director Saley, so what would be the priority for your department and your different departments within the department? Is it first and foremost filling these positions or is there certain line items that you want to bring to our attention that you feel are underfunded? I think it's a combination of both. We, we obviously the equipment account in the garage is underfunded. We've, we've been able to tie it together and make it work uh, for a number of years, but I, I think we're at the breaking point um, with that. So I, I think that should be increased probably at least $250,000 because that's what we took out of town aid. What was that number? 250000 That's what we took out of town aid. And, and as Chairman Vitro said, we were lucky this year that we didn't have a lot of snow. That was without a lot of snow, without using a lot of salt and other equipment like plow blades and everything else we needed. So it was, we were very fortunate to be able to take that money out of town aid. But I think the idea is to be able to put accounts that are matched appropriately so that we know you know what we have so the, the equipment account is is one of them in, in garage the other one is solid waste it, it's going to continue to go up and not just this year but the following year is going to be the big the big elephant in the room because we anticipate somewhere in the ballpark of about twenty dollars a ton increase that's a significant we went from uh, 64 and change to 68 this year with the cost of living this is going to be the new contract if we work it out. Okay, thank you. Any more questions for Public Works? Alderman German. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Through you to uh, Director Saley. Um, can you just uh, explain a little bit on our road paving, how much funding you're getting and how many miles of roads are you taking care of? I know there's a lot going on in the city. Maybe you can just share with us. Yes, I, I believe this year it's going to be $2 million. We're going to, we're going to work with the utility companies. As everyone's aware, the, the gas company is required by Pura to uh, install new plastic pipe and get rid of a lot of the old uh, cast iron pipes that are leaking. That's probably a 10 to 15 year process. Uh, and we, we have to do a better job coordinating with the gas company to make sure that when projects get started with them, that we follow through with them. Uh, so that we're not paving a road and then next year they're going to be ripping it up. So right now we have $2 million. That's, that's our number. That, not only that, but sidewalk work that, we, that we're doing. And how many miles of, of road will that be paved wise? I'd have to calculate that out. If, I mean, 15. no, it wouldn't be that much, Steve, not with $2 yeah, million. Dollars. Two, that's right. you, you're probably about seven and a half to eight. eight. Somewhere in that ballpark. And Mr. Chairman, just to clarify, the amount that we have bonded for that your board authorized funding for in February was $2 million. Um, in terms of the money that we have available for paving and sidewalks, if you include some of the, the grant money that we have, including uh, low SIP, uh, municipal grant aid, and uh, town aid road, is between two to three times that amount. Two to three times two million. I, I don't think it's that much, Mayor. And I just verified with our finance director. I thought you were going to use that money for some other items, but okay. Hmm, okay. Um, uh, another question. Is there any major um, projects or maybe something that's 
been deferred maintenance wise or lack of staff or lack of funds? Any major things that are coming up that are potentially going to cost the city a, a, a lot of money? I know there's pumps, uh, you know, a lot of uh, sewer pump stations and things that are aging and uh, I don't know what we're getting to and what we're not getting to, but something along those lines is what I'm thinking. So through, through the ARPA funding, we, we are replacing a, a substantial amount of the generators uh, at the pump stations. So that's an expense both at, uh, at West Ave and also at uh, Shadyside. Those are our two main pump stations. Uh, but there's also a number of smaller pump stations we're getting replaced. We have two pump station projects that are going on. One is Rogers Ave, which is a significant pump station. And then there's four or five other smaller pump stations that we're going to work. You know, the question is, where, where do we see a need? Wastewater is something that never goes away. The pumps run 24-7, 365. There's a high, a high amount of usage. Um, the issues that we have right now with wastewater is we have a lot of grease getting into the system, and we have a lot of these uh, wipes that people think are biodegradable that are not. So that's the cost where we're getting into a lot of things. Yeah, that was going to be the next question. Those wipes that people are using, I mean, that really should be brought up in an ordinance and, and banned in Milford because I know we've had a lot of issues with that where it just jams up all the, the grinders and it causes a lot of problems and it's really unnecessary in my opinion. We're, 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 we're vacking out a lot of the dry or wet wells in the pump stations. Again, a cost that was probably never thought of. So it's something that we should be looking at as a long-term plan. I don't know if you can ban them. I think people are still going to use them. Uh, most people think they're organic and they break down, but they don't. Alderman Parente. Thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> Through you, I've got a couple of things. Thank you to you both for being here. Um, I just heard something about LOSIP and Milford Granite. I just wanted to get clarification from you or the mayor, because I know we were talking about the North Street project several months ago, and there was an allocation for the project amount <clears throat> for LOSIP and the, the Granite. So if we're dedicating it to this and So, the so the, that's from years past when we got a, a, a specific application waiver to OPM that's been uh, earmarked for that project. Again, that was several years ago. The more recent uh, municipal grant and aids uh, have been designated specifically for road work. And when I say road work, the type of um, work that we do uh, on, to maintain the roads like paving, uh, or sidewalk repair or work within the municipal right away. It could also be utilized for equipment uh, that works on uh, the municipal right away as well. So the money <clears throat> for the North Street project is from former years? There was an application to OPM several years ago, yes. And we had received a waiver for it at the time? Several years ago. Okay, because this was produced for us this year. It kind of suggested that <clears throat> the allocations were current. And, and they're earmarked in the reserve fund, yes. Okay, could we get more information on the board, some kind of summary that's a little more extensive than this so we can better understand how the low SIP and the Milford Grant aid monies are being dispersed? Sure. I would appreciate that. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, and then I have a question about the ARPA plan. I saw um, there's a Department of Public Works project manager in here. It looks like for over a three-year period. <clears throat> but I also saw one, a construction project manager in the budget book. Um, are those different positions? They are. There are two different positions, and that position that the ARPA position has not been filled as part of the 23 positions that are pre presently vacant. Um, Pat Devine, mm -hmm. who is our project manager mm -hmm. within the city, will assist with any projects that we're going to do with ARPA. That's our plan, or at least our okay. goal. So we haven't, we haven't been able to find someone uh, for the dollar amount. I assume I haven't been involved with the hiring process of that individual, so I'm not really speaking probably out of turn. Okay. Um, I would like to, I would like to yes, clear please. something up, too. Um, we do get, so everyone knows, we get uh, town aid twice a year and round numbers. And Peter, can you, it's about 300,000, 325 uh, every time. 
Yes, that's correct. It's about 300,000 twice, uh, two times during the fiscal year. So that money is available for, as the mayor says, is avail available for uh, road work and sidewalk work. When the mayor says two or three times, we have it. I, I, I'd like to see that account. I don't know where it is because I think there's a million in it, but maybe I'm wrong. There, there was a couple of different grants that we cited, um, including the LOTSIP, I'm sorry, LOSIP, and including the municipal grant aid and the municipal grant aid. There's how much, Peter? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, through you, I think this will clarify. We, the, what we're talking about here is the current municipal grant aid allocation that's coming for this fiscal year, 22-23. It's a, about, uh, I believe, a little over $2 million. And OPM approved a waiver just for the fire department roofs in, in the amount of about 300 and 55,000, so if you uh, take that away, it's approximately two million that's left for roads. So that's, a, that's the municipal grant and aid component. And the town aid road is a longstanding annual grant um, of about 600,000 uh, per year that we get every year uh, from the state. And both uh, may be used for roads. Yes, and we have whatever is left available under previous municipal grant and aid road allocations for road repair, um, also available for public works. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you Peter. <clears throat> Thank you, Peter, for clarifying that for us. Any more questions for public works? Alderman Parente. Thank you. Um, so just through you to, to Peter, if I might ask, it's a little confusing still to me. So we have a low SIP amount that comes in, I think, every year. It's based on a formula, and there's, I think, even a database available to look at. So it's a kind of a crude amount. <clears throat> and that has a lot of flexibility around how it can be utilized in a municipality. The municipal grant aid is more narrowly, <clears throat> it needs to have a waiver attached to it in order to be utilized outside of sort of highway road maintenance, is that correct? Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, uh, yes, more or less that's correct. The, the low SIP grant has more flexibility. Um, however, the city has to uh, file a formal project application with OPM to get the project approved as if it fits the criteria. And normally road repair does, and there are a host of other projects that would. Yes, there is flexibility. Um, so you have that component to consider. And for municipal granted aid, it, it's more straightforward. It's defaulted to the town aid road statute. So if we do not get or apply for a waiver and we don't get any waiver approved, then the entire amount has to be used for town aid road purposes. Um, and that includes paving and buying equipment related to maintaining the roads, et cetera. Um, if we do get a waiver like we did for the fire department roofs, then that money is allocated for that. Thank you. Did we get a waiver for North Street? Through you, Mr. Chairman. As, as the mayor said, we did get a waiver for North Street, but okay. that was for um, some time ago. Some time ago. Uh, the current year, the only waiver we got was that 300 and I believe 55,000 for the fire department. Okay, that's so helpful. Thank you so much. Um, and then another question I have, I, uh, uh, Alderman Marlow and I are both liaisons to the sewer um, department, and I have to commend them for their wonderful work. I mean, it's just so comprehensive what they do. And I have seen over the months that there seems to be a little, um, there might be an overstressed capacity <clears throat> in terms of the workers who are, um, I don't know if that's an area where, where there is a staffing issue or where there could be someone filling that. I know some other departments have found exceptions. I think the police department had an exception with being able to fill a position. Is there anything you would ask us to think about and be aware of in terms of specific positions that you think are urgent, that are coming with the summer, uh, the summer months up ahead that we would want to be thinking about? Thank you. So, so presently in, in wastewater, I believe there's three vacant positions. I think we have one person on extended uh, workers' comp, uh, so that's four people. I, I think the biggest issue, skilled people, um, it's challenging right now in the employment world, and, and I think through contract negotiations, we should be looking at increasing some of the salaries to make the city more attractive to outside people. Oh, 
Alderman Gurman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I know it's getting late. Um, so, Chris, you mentioned that our, our packers, our garbage trucks, are they all like five years old or six years old? 2016, when did we get this? So the, the, the automated trucks were right around 2016. Um, we just purchased two rear loaders that came in, and truthfully, we've had some issues with them in regards to uh, uh, emissions and other things that came in. But these trucks are heavy use, so you should almost have a cycle where almost every year you're buying one, so you don't have to buy five at a time or six at a time. And the hardest thing right now, it used to be, you know, eight months, six months, nine months to get one. Now it's up to two years. So that's the issue we have right now. That, so that was a question. So we used to do that many years ago. We had a rolling stock and, and we just, you know, every, like you said, every year we put one in the, in, in, the, in the coffers. So, you know, as one retired, another one, new one would come out. And I know we bought all these at the same time. So yeah, they're probably gonna all fail around the same time, which is gonna put us in a big pickle. Um, but we don't have any in, 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 the, in the coffers coming down the, down the pipeline, huh? No automated trucks at the present time. No. And Mr. Chairman, as you remember, back in February, uh, you authorized bonding for an automated truck with a hydraulic lift. And we do it every couple of years. And that was, again, just a few months ago that we authorized that. Okay, so we'll have to revisit that. Thank you. Any more questions for Public Works? Alderman Parente. Thank you. Um, this isn't a question. <laughs> it's actually just a comment. I, um, I want to thank you both. I know that you're available 24-7, morning, noon, night, on the weekends. Um, I know how hard you both work, and thank you uh, on behalf of our community. Thanks. Thank you. Any more questions for Public Works? Seeing none, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, thank you for all the work you do for the city. Thank you. Thank you for staying out here for the latest. You're, you're always last. What the hell? Uh, last year, I think it was last this year. So we're uh, used That's because we you. like you. Everybody have a great night. I would like to entertain a motion to recess. Mr. Chairman, not to belabor the meeting, but uh, after 20 years, in hundreds and hundreds of meetings in this uh, chapel of democracy, this will be my last one as an elected official. And I just want to thank you all for the many years of support and the many years of good late night meetings. Uh, I hope to uh, attend some future meetings in another capacity. I wish you well. Good luck. Godspeed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Chairman? Yes, Alderman. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, want to congratulate and wish uh, Mayor Blake um, the best of luck on all your future endeavors. I've worked with Mayor Blake uh, since the time he became mayor as the uh, minority leader. So it's been a good run. Thank you. We need a motion to recess and a second. We got a motion to recess and a second. All in favor? Opposed? We're in recess.